Welcome, everyone. My name is Adam Levine, and I'm joined today by our co-host, Dave Pilati. We're just going to give a short introduction now uh, before we begin. So on behalf of the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University, we are very pleased to welcome you to the first ever research symposium on civil military coordination and humanitarian response. So I'm speaking to you today from the Watson Institute, where many of us met as a group just two years ago as part of our third annual Civilian Military Humanitarian Response Workshop, organized in collaboration with the Humanitarian Response Program at the US Naval War College. During that workshop, we asked all of our working groups to prioritize the most pressing research questions in the civil humanitarian space. And from that, we consolidated those questions into the four topics that you will hear presented today. In order to tackle these research questions, we required three components. We needed funding, of course, and for that we are thankful to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, which provided us with two years of funding to conduct this research and organize this symposium. We also needed the right people with the right experience, and for this we are thankful not only to the lead researchers for each of these four projects who you'll be hearing from today, but also to the groups of advisors who helped design their studies and review their analyses afterwards, as well as our student research assistants who helped support the collection of data and literature reviews. And finally, we required a broad network of humanitarian, military, local academic contacts around the world, which we are lucky to have through the affiliated organizations and fellows of both CHRHS here at Brown and HRP at the Naval War College. Following the ethos of our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies and the Watson Institute as a whole, these research projects that you'll hear today are incredibly interdisciplinary in nature, spanning the range of different methodological approaches, uh, including anthropology, public health, political science, history, and legal studies. But the complexity of humanitarian challenges in general, and civil coordination especially, cannot be approached by a single discipline or methodology but rather require a range of approaches, uh, which is what we sought to create for these uh, research uh, questions that we tackled. Importantly, we've also engaged in these research efforts, not only affiliates from Brown and the Naval War College, but also our CHRHS Global Fellows from around the world to ensure we had diversity of lived experience baked into the research design and analysis. CR CHRHS Global Fellows make up half of our primary presenters today and many of the advisors to these different projects. The reports you'll hear today represent the culmination of two years of work, but they're also just the first step uh, for our new center uh, on what will be a much larger journey of building up the evidence base for civilian military humanitarian coordination. To that end, I'm very excited to announce this morning for the first time publicly, that we will be launching a new program on civil military humanitarian coordination within our Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at Brown University. Funded by a generous four-year grant from the R. Dudley Harrington Charitable Foundation, this new program will allow us to continue to expand upon the research presented here today, while also pursuing new areas of investigation within this space. In fact, we will be providing funding for the working groups that you'll hear from tomorrow at our workshop to pursue, to pursue additional research questions that arise out of their discussions. And we're also currently in the process of collecting data for a separate project funded by the US State Department that'll be analyzing best practices for civilian military coordination in three specific conflict and disaster settings around the world. We are keen to ensure the uptake and impact of our research findings. We're not here to do research just for the sake of research, but we wanna ensure that it actually improves the delivery of humanitarian assistance around the world. To that end, we will be exploring new ways to disseminate the evidence base that we build here, whether through the development of best practices, guidelines, trainings, simulations, or the creation of new networks and communities of practice. Just very briefly to go through some of the logistics, each of the presenters will have about 20 to 30 minutes to present, followed by about 15 to 20 minutes of questions and discussion. 
Rigorous research must be subjected to rigorous critique. And so we look forward to hearing your opinions about what our researchers got right, when they missed the mark, and how we could improve in the future. Uh, we're also keenly interested to hear your ideas about where we could take this research going forward. Please enter your questions and thoughts into the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar at any time during the presentation. Either Dave or I will be reading all of those Q&A suggestions that come in, and then we'll be reading those out loud uh, to the presenters at the end of their presentation so that they can answer the questions and respond to the comments. We look forward to some very healthy academic, academic debate. Please be advised that both these presentations as well as the Q&A are being video recorded uh, for public posting on our website afterwards. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Dave Pilati for his remarks. Adam, thank you so much and good morning, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I have to say it's a bit humbling as I look at my other screen and, and see names and I know people's locations that it's the middle of the night or really, really early in the morning in some places and that you were kind enough to join us today. So thank you. Even though we can't necessarily see your faces on the screen, we see your names and truly grateful for you participating today. Uh, I'd like to start with just some thanks, many thanks to Brown University for this uh, very, very special partnership. This is a humanitarian civil military coordination uh, effort. And so it takes two to tango, it takes two to talk, it takes two to, to debate and have dialogue. And so having civilian partners along with the military players in this is just, it's incredibly meaningful. I wanted to especially thank our incredible network of academic partners that work with Brown and the War College and so many amazing humanitarian organizations that are both with us today and work with us on a regular basis on all these critical issues that we're gonna explore today and tomorrow and in the years ahead. And I especially wanted to thank the Carnegie Corporation of New York and the Naval War College Foundation for their generous support that allows us to help advance the art and science of humanitarian response. And we do that through rigorous research and education and simulation. The US Naval War College, our mission, uh, it's, it's right on our website, but I think a lot of people forget the focus of the War College is to educate and develop future leaders. And they are, yes, current leaders at the same time by building strategic and cultural perspective so that we can enhance graduates' ability to advise senior leaders and policymakers around the world. We challenge our students in Newport to think deeply about the broad range of potential missions that militaries may undertake and that they do undertake every single day. And in an increasingly dangerous and unpredictable world, developing critical thinkers who can positively impact the field of humanitarian and civil military coordination it's an urgent requirement. I think everyone on this call today understands how important it is. When we stood up the humanitarian response program in Newport almost six years ago, our, our goal was pretty simple. It was to help militaries, not just the US military, but also international militaries, get better and improve their effectiveness when they conduct humanitarian assistance and disaster response operations. And we have certainly seen a shift in our focus from natural disaster settings into conflict settings in that six year period. Uh, we're, we're really fortunate and I can't say thanks enough again that we are able to partner and collaborate with so many leading academic universities, humanitarian organization and civilian agencies because to be frank, if we couldn't work with you and have dialogue with you in these neutral safe academic spaces, I don't know that we would be able to help advance humanitarian civil military coordination in complex emergencies, natural disasters and pandemic environments. I, as I was putting together my thoughts last night, I, I went back into email to 2015, 2016, and took a peek at the origins of our very first humanitarian response workshop that was held in October of 2016. And then I took a look at all the activities that have unfolded from all these great collaborations and partnerships from all, all the people on this call today. And then when I woke up this morning, I took my quick peek at the news and it's, it's all bad. It's conflict and people dying and COVID and hurricanes and wildfires and all of these impacts of climate change. And so as I am excited about today and I look at the research we've done over the past six or so years, I realize that none of it has been as collaborative and timely and meaningful as the research we're gonna talk about today because this was an exceptionally collaborative two-year effort. 
with so many different players. Our amazing research teams who you're going to meet today, the advisory groups who constantly gave them feedback, all of the organizations that allowed them to be interviewed. And I, I realize this is just a springboard, as, as Adam said earlier, for us to do even more relevant and impactful research moving forward. So while it is certainly difficult in Zoom to adequately express my excitement and thanks, I just wanna say we are really grateful for you spending time with us today. And with no further ado, let's get things started. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm gonna just begin by introducing briefly our first presenter. So Rob Grace, is a researcher and affiliate fellow at the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies here at Brown University, where he undertakes research on humanitarian military relations. During the 2019 to 2020 academic year, he served as a United States Institute of Peace Minerva Peace Scholar. His work has been published by the Journal of Conflict and Security Law, World Health Population, Conflict and Health, the Journal of International Humanitarian Legal Studies, among many others. We're really thrilled to have him partnering with us on this project, and I will turn it over to him now to begin his presentation. As I mentioned before, please enter your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll be asking them of Rob after he finishes. Thanks so much, Adam, for the intro, and hello to you all. It's great to uh, be with you. Looking forward to uh, kicking off this, um, uh, this presentation uh, here, kicking, kicking off the day. Um, I, uh, in this session, I'll be giving an overview of how I see the field of humanitarian military relations um, uh, with an angle of looking at what contemporary challenges are. Um, and um, also sort of focusing a bit on how to conceptualize this field. So we'll be a bit in this session uh, hanging out in the conceptual clouds uh, but I invite you to join me up here in the conceptual clouds and then um, uh, the presentations throughout the rest of the day, I think will bring you back, back to the ground and hopefully the, um, uh, some of the concepts I lay out and some of the other ideas that um, I and others will lay out in, in the other uh, panels throughout the day um, will, um, will complement one another very well. Um, so to get things going, uh, what I actually wanted to do is start with a, a pop quiz um, to get our, our brain juices flowing together. Um, so I have a, um, a pop quiz with three questions that I want to ask you, and I think these questions will sort of lay out um, a bit what, I'll, what I'm interested in, in uh, exploring here today. So pull up your Q&A window, because what I will want you to do is to... to if you know the answer, type in your answer to the Q&A window. And if you're the first one to get the answer, then you get the glory of, uh, of being the first one who answered. That will stay with you for the rest of your life. Um, so here's the first question. Again, pull up the Q&A window, get your typing hands ready. And here we go. The question is, who is this? Whoa, Joseph, very, very great. Okay. I oh, great. Okay. You all know it very good, of course, because we have a, uh, a good humanitarian crowd there. It's Henri Dunant, uh, one of the founders of the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement in the 1800s. Um, uh, an idea that stemmed from his experience at the Battle of Solferino in 1859, in which he became involved in uh, providing um, uh, some uh, some relief to wounded soldiers there. Um, and uh, a foundational moment for the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement, and also uh, a foundational moment that has led to the current humanitarian system uh, as we know it. Uh, I start with uh, do not, because this moment at the Battle of Solferino and this idea to create standing relief societies was also a moment of civil military coordination in which he and his colleagues saw that there was a real uh, capacity gap on the part of militaries and the vision was to have uh, auxiliary civilian entities coming in to fill that capacity gap. Uh, additionally, this idea was not without uh, controversy. Uh, there was a 
debate about whether this was actually a good idea. There was concern that uh, uh, creating these relief societies would be uh, exposing themselves to the possibility of being instrumentalized by the political and military leaders who were fighting wars at that time. There was concern about the fact that these efforts would be making war fighting uh, easier. There's debate about whose responsibility this should be. Should it really be the uh, responsibility of these civilian organizations to uh, step in and fill this capacity gap? Or should it be the responsibility of militaries to uh, be uh, bolstering their own capacities uh, in this area? So I start with this moment and I start with this debate because we see these same issues, we see these same uh, dilemmas uh, and debates uh, happening today. And these issues that we're still talking about have a very long historical uh, pedigree that uh, to me seems very much uh, underexplored in terms of how it has evolved over time and how this central tension and dilemma has, has, remained, um, has remained constant. Uh, and you'll see in uh, the next presentation from uh, San Sangeetha in particular, how this question of responsibility is still being uh, discussed and has ambiguity around it today. Okay, that's the humanitarian side. Here's question number two of our surprise quiz. Again, get your Q&A box ready. Uh, get your uh, fingertips ready. Joseph, maybe you can go two for two. I don't know. Maybe someone else can beat him to it. But here we go. Who is this? <laughs> Joseph doesn't know. So it's a wide open field for people to jump in. Dead Carl, says Stacy. Um, <laughs> uh, someone says Larry. Okay, okay, Clausewitz Klaus says, uh, says Stacy and, and some others. It's Clausewitz, Prussian uh, military leader and strategist of the 1800s. Um, and um, I, uh, I bring him in as the, the second figure I'm introducing uh, to also introduce a long history that there is on the military side of contributing to emergency response. Uh, uh, Clausewitz died in the line of duty uh, but he did not die uh, during a battle. He died uh, as a part of the Prussian military's response to the cholera outbreak that had happened uh, at that time. So I bring that into the discussion just to highlight the fact that uh, many of the issues that we're discussing, discussing now that, that we see uh, uh, in the context of, of COVID with uh, militaries and, and police uh, uh, enforcing movements across borders and, and, and controlling movements across uh, borders and even within uh, countries also has a long historical uh, pedigree that I also think has been underexplored. And I think that um, uh, probing more deeply the history of these dynamics can help us understand our current situation today. Our third and final question for a pop quiz today. Let's see. Who can get this? Question number three, who is this? Might be a bit tougher for this crowd. Does anybody know? Maybe you need to think about it a little bit. Let's see, hold on. I, I see Ziad says, <laughs> you know Slim's long lost cousin. For all I know, that might be true, but we'd have to research that on, on Ancestry.com, I, I suppose. Um, anyone else? I'll, I'll let sort of an awkward pause linger for a bit more in case anyone wants to take a stab at it. Samuel Huntington. Sam Boland uh, gets it, um, as does Charlie. This is Samuel Huntington. Huntington. I introduce him as well as the third figure at, at the top of the day. Um, because of the fact that in 1957, he uh, wrote a book called uh, The Soldier in the State, and it was one of the foundational texts of uh, what emerged into the field of civil military uh, relations, a, a social scientific field of political scientists and sociologists examining the dynamics at play 
um, in the relations between civilian and military uh, actors. Um, but I bring him in because just as I see that there has been not as much exploration as I would like to see on the humanitarian side in terms of hit the history of the issues we see today and on the military side in terms of the issues we see today, there has also not been a marriage of this field of uh, policy of humanitarian military relations and this social scientific field of civil military relations that uh, for decades has been exploring similar issues and has produced a uh, very rich um, uh, pile of empirical and theoretical insights. So just as we see that uh, there are bridges that need to be built between uh, humanitarians and military actors to make uh, response more effective. There are also bridges between policy and scholarship and theory that need to be uh, built and strengthened um, to make humanitarian response more, uh, more effective uh, as well. And that is um, indeed um, part of what we are doing here today. So before I uh, delve more deeply into getting ourselves up into uh, the conceptual uh, clouds, um, a few comments about the research uh, that I did. And by the way, good job on, on this pop quiz, everybody, you've all passed. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, the research that I did was based on interviews and a literature review. I conducted uh, 38 uh, interviews, um, with people working for humanitarian organizations, with militaries and civilian governmental uh, agencies. Um, interviewees discussed um, issues of humanitarian relation, humanitarian military relations in uh, contexts of natural disaster response, armed conflict, peacekeeping, post-conflict, disease outbreak, uh, forced displacement. And I conducted these interviews in various locations around, around the greater Boston area, greater DC area, Geneva, and I did um, uh, several uh, remotely as well via phone uh, and Skype. Uh, additionally, to complement that, um, I pulled together a literature review. Um, uh, very much appreciate uh, the assistance of my two research assistants, uh, Anna, Anna Makaritz and Melissa Godfrey, who spent essentially last summer pulling together every um, publication we could find that was relevant uh, to uh, this space so that we could see uh, the gaps between uh, what is there an existing literature review and the issues that were coming out from uh, from the from the interviews that I that I conducted um, so I'm gonna lay out sort of three concepts the first one is more about terminology and definition uh, you might notice I've been using the term humanitarian military relations. Uh, and this is a bit in contrast to many of the other terms that uh, you have seen out there. There's humanitarian civil military coordination or SIMCORD as OCHA calls it. There's civil military coordination or CIMIC as many militaries refer to it. There's UN uh, civil military coordination or UN CIMIC as the UN will re refer to it. That relates to um, civil military coordination in the context of um, uh, peacekeeping operations. Uh, CMR, civil military relations, is the terminology that the Red Cross Red Crescent uh, movement uses. Um, HMI, humanitarian military interaction, is the name of the unit um, created within WFP. So I just flag this to note that there are uh, different terms that different organizations use. They are somewhat different from one another in, in what they mean and how people understand them. I'm using the term humanitarian military relations um, as a way to say that I'm not necessarily looking at any one of these um, approaches, but looking at the field more broadly from a bird's eye view and trying to discern how all these efforts fit together or in what ways they haven't uh, fit together uh, thus far. Um, but the term humanitarian military relations um, it itself is perhaps a bit uh, imprecise. Um, so let's dissect it a bit together. Humanitarian. What does it mean to be a humanitarian organization? So um, 
you know, we know that there are the large humanitarian organizations, but we also know that um, there is no um, sort of definitive contours around what divides a humanitarian organization from an organization that is not humanitarian. Uh, we are talking about civilian organizations when we're talking about humanitarian organizations. We're talking about organizations that are at least guided by humanitarian principles of impartiality, independence, um, humanity, um, uh, and um, uh, uh, the uh, fact that um, we sort of define the field of humanitarianism by these uh, principles is sort of part of the problem because the principles are very contested. And there are instances in which organizations are accused of not being humanitarian because they have strayed too far from the principles. So just wanted to flag that as, as an element of this uh, domain that the edges around it are a bit, a bit gray, a bit fuzzy, a bit contested. Uh, on the military side, um, there can be a bit of ambiguity uh, there as well. Uh, you know what militaries are, it also incorporates uh, uh, peacekeeping uh, operations, um, but can also include um, other types of armed actors that you don't think of as militaries, non-state armed groups, uh, police forces, it could be uh, intelligence agencies. Um, so in this sense, the, the word military uh, has in a way become a, a shorthand for a larger array of groups. Uh, and then there's relations. What actually are the uh, dimensions of the relations between these two types of actors? And to delve into that, this issue of what the dynamics of the relations are, I'll introduce a second issue. And I'll start with this, which I suspect we've all seen before, or some version of this we've seen before. Uh, but I just wanted to lay it out as a starting point for how the field of humanitarian military relations has traditionally been understood. It's that this is the, the three C's framework. Though sometimes there are more than three C's in different ways that it's been presented. Um, but in general, the notion is that there's a spectrum of different contexts where different uh, modes of interaction are more appropriate. And on the one hand, you have a natural disaster context where there can be cooperation between humanitarian and military actors. The military actors play uh, perhaps a very visible role in the distribution of humanitarian uh, relief. On the other side of the spectrum, it's an armed conflict or a complex emergency in which According to this framework, a uh, mode of coexistence is appropriate between humanitarian and military actors. Notion being that they should not be cooperating in such contexts because in such contexts, it is particularly important for humanitarians to be able to demonstrate that they're independent from, uh, from political forces. They're not being instrumentalized by these forces. So it's coexistence. Um, so that's, that's the logic, that's, that's the framework. Here are a few uh, interviewee statements about um, how they see this framework. Binary and one dimensional, not appropriate for what we're doing today. A major gap in conceptual uh, clarity. Um, so there's a dissatisfaction with this framework. Um, and there are several reasons why. One reason is that there can be a lack of consensus across different organizations about what type of context, context we view this as. If we're talking about a protracted um, conflict situation where conflict ebbs and flows and there's a natural disaster, um, in that context, some organizations might, might view it as a natural disaster context and might uh, consider that they can cooperate more deeply with military actors. Others might see it more if through an armed context lens and might want to maintain more distance. But then if you have different organizations taking different approaches, then that can um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, have reputational costs for across different organizations. Um, so here's another reason. Um, I want to lay out a different way of looking at this. The logic of what I'm going to lay out comes from the interviews that I uh, conducted, uh, but I want to put it into two dimensions. 
especially since one of my interviewees criticized this as being one dimensional. Let's put it into two dimensions. So we have one dimension, which is the spectrum of different contexts, from peaceful on one side, situation of conflict on the other side. We'll have the second dimension, the y-axis, and have that be the extent of humanitarian military engagement, which can range from low at the bottom to high at the top. The logic of the three C's framework is this, that peaceful context, it can be high, conflict situations, it should be low. But that is, if what you're talking about is the issue of military engagement in humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, or H-A-D-R. Uh, the issue that is now at the forefront of humanitarian military relations is that there are multiple dimensions of these engagements that go beyond a military involvement in HADR. There is access. And access, the need to engage uh, between humanitarians and militaries on, a, on a issues of access, uh, seems to increase when we go from peace, uh, context of peace to a conflict, a context of conflict. Reason being that there are uh, more complexities that might arise. There's difficulties of navigating relationships between a government and a non-state armed group, and so on and so forth. It's not that there is not a need for access negotiation in a natural disaster context, and that there are not access issues, but that the complexity of the access issues and the need and, and depth of that engagement, um, I would expect to increase as we move toward a more conflict situation. Same with uh, security. Uh, in a conflict situation, we'll see issues of uh, armed escorts and discussions about when it's appropriate to use armed escorts and different organizations adopting uh, different um, approaches to that, as well as um, the issue of humanitarian notification systems, which Nasan will be speaking more about uh, later today, and protection as well. Um, uh, increasing. So this is what I see as um, the state of the dynamics of interactions between humanitarians and military actors and how they shift depending on what the context is. It is true that if we're talking about HADR, it goes down when we're moving in that direction. But the other arrows point the other way. And the challenge is how to navigate these different dimensions um, of uh, these interactions when one is going down and the others are going up. Additionally, these areas of security, access, protection, they have some overlap with humanitarian military relations, but they also encompass a wide array of other issues that are not directly related to humanitarian military relations. So the question is how to uh, understand that overlap and how to coordinate within that over overlap as well as coordinate that overlap with the sort of broader issue areas of, of security, access, and protection. So that's a bit of how I see what, the, uh, what some of the central challenges are. Um, I'm going to lay out a third and final thing before I draw my uh, comments to a close. And this is um, my um, effort to start to bridge the gap between theory and practice. I'm going to lay out a framework uh, that uh, comes from the field of civil military relations and political science. Um, I've adapted it specifically for humanitarian military relations, so I've adapted it slightly. Um, but I do believe that this, the logic of this framework helps to illuminate a bit of the, uh, the challenges that we, that we see in this field. Um, so here it is. We have coordination. And the theory that I think all of us um, believe, which is why we're here, is that coordination facilitates effectiveness in humanitarian outcomes. We might um, not know exactly how we would conceptualize or define or measure effectiveness, but in some way this is uh, the logic of what we're talking about. We wanna improve coordination 
so that we can uh, improve effectiveness. The humanitarian military relations trinity, as this is called, introduces this third dimension, which is efficiency, which is basically um, how, how cost effective it is, how much does it cost? And um, the central issue that the Trinity illuminates is that efficiency is in tension with effectiveness, because the more money you throw at a humanitarian crisis, perhaps the more effective it will be because the more people in need will be getting the resources that they need, but then efficiency decreases because you're using more resources to do that. The same is true with coordination, that efficiency and coordination are in tension with one another because coordination itself requires an investment. It requires resources and the more resources you put into it, the less efficient less a cost cost effective it is so when we're talking about all the dimensions that feed into making coordination more um, effective uh, capacity building relationship building uh, developing guidelines creating procedural frameworks all of those efforts require um, an investment um, and on the dimensions of investing in coordination you'll hear more about it from um, in a later session that I will be doing at the end of the day with, with, with Brittany Card on the state of the civil military coordination service uh, in the UN. Um, but I lay out this framework um, uh, as a way to conceptualize how we see uh, the process of coordination influencing outcomes and how we see the dynamics at play and how we invest in those outcomes. A few final thoughts from me about uh, the route forward. Uh, what I think, where I think we need to go, um, what, what I think we need to do. Uh, one, the path ahead entails discerning lessons from contemporary and historical case studies. There's been a lot of great case study work uh, done, but there's much more that I think should be conducted. And I'm happy to say that Brown is, is working more on that front. But also I wanna highlight the value of historical case studies as well, and the importance of us understanding uh, where we came from in this field, how we got here, so that we're not just reinventing the wheel um, each time. Assessing impact on military's reputation. How does uh, military engagement in humanitarian response influence how they're perceived? On perceptions of humanitarian response, uh, on humanitarian delivery uh, outcomes. So there's a need for some really rigorous uh, social scientific research that can uh, assess all of these dynamics. Cultivating a more in-depth conceptual understanding of this field. I think there's much more that can be done, much more that can be drawn from the literature on civil military relations that can be applied to the humanitarian space to deepen our understanding of it. Uh, and assessing the state of capacity building, relationship building, guidelines and procedural frameworks so that we understand where we're at and where we need to go. Um, so that's all to say that uh, the road ahead, I think, is, is very vast. There's much work uh, to be done. There's a great need for uh, collaboration between practitioners, policymakers, and academic institutions. Uh, and I'm glad that we're all here today uh, together taking a step uh, in that direction. I will end it there and um, happy to answer any questions that uh, have come up. Thank you so much, Rob, <clears throat> for that presentation. And thank you for finishing right on time. We really appreciate that. So we have a few questions that have come up in the Q&A. And so I'll start uh, giving those out to you now. Um, so first comes from Len Rubenstein. He says that there seems to be another dimension of relations in conflict, protection beyond access and security. It seems that this is a critical dimension. For example, four years ago, the UN Security Council passed a resolution on protection of healthcare and conflict that urge states to address military operational doctrine and training to better protect healthcare and conflict. Since then, there has been almost no action. DOD committed to review and did not. How do you address these issues in your framework? Right, yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. I think what it illuminates a bit is uh, the different levels at which humanitarian and military relations uh, occurs. Mostly what I, was talking about in the presentation, the logic of the three C's framework is um, 
largely a field-based uh, framework for understanding um, what happens at the operational level. Um, but what Len's question illuminates is an important dimension that I did not touch on, but it, it is touched on in, touch on it in the, the paper, um, but is the, the efforts at, at the global level of advocacy uh, and uh, efforts to build relationships at higher levels to influence um, uh, uh, doctrine and influence approaches of, you know, that the military is to take, uh, adopt, um, engaging at, at higher levels. Um, so um, in a sense, I, I see that as a bit of a, a different dimension of it. Um, there are many uh, aspects of humanitarian military relations that I think sort of fall outside at, outside the framework, and, and this is one of them. Another one that I'll, I'll highlight is uh, humanitarian military engagements on uh, innovation, and it's something that uh, Josiah Kaplan has written about, and he's um, involved in uh, our work here uh, at Brown uh, as well. Um, so, I, so I suppose that's my that's my response to that. But of course, the, the issue that that Len raises is, is an extremely uh, important one. Um, uh, but to me, these interactions at the Security Council and um, at, at higher levels um, of military actors are um, a bit of a different dimension of humanitarian military relations, but albeit an extremely important one. Great. Um, now we have another question. I'm going to apologize if I mispronounce the name from Lashmi Bouguir. Um, from coordination, cooperation, and coexistence, where and how would you consider the curtain approach? The fundamental question remaining with independence and impartiality in coordinating and cooperating with armed actors, where identity and profile as a humanitarian organization can face limitations with increasing operational and programmatic risk. Um, so I'm going to, um, to presume that the curtain, by, by the curtain approach, what you're referring to is, to, is essentially an effort to uh, not be transparent about the extent to which humanitarians and military actors are uh, engaging. Um, so that came up a lot in the uh, interviews that I uh, conducted, especially around uh, security. Um, and it's, you know, really seemed to be interviewees talk to me about uh, instances in which uh, it leads to uh, tensions between humanitarian and military actors in contexts of insecurity where humanitarians are depending on the security of armed actors, but are not wanting to advertise that to the population in the context where they're working uh, leads to a perception of like, why is this? Why is it that you're adopting a stance of, of um, distance, um, but um, in actuality, it's a stance of uh, dependence? Um, and if it's not sort of effectively communicated, it uh, can lead to tensions across the humanitarian military divide. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Jenny McAvoy, um, or common at least. Uh, not sure the Trinity, as explained, uh, serves the objective of accountability in terms of the obligations of military forces. How would you address that? Right, yeah, uh, that is an important comment. Um, and let's see, I think I would have to think about how that, um, how that would play into it. Um, you know, um, the, the, in a way, the logic is, is similar, I think. The logic of the Trinity is essentially that <clears throat> these all require a, an investment. It requires resources to do it. Um, so, you know, I think you could sort of plug it into the framework in that you need, in order to uh, promote accountability, uh, you need an investment in that in that effort, and uh, it's a question of how you can do that most effectively. Um, so that's definitely something to to think about more in in how I think about this framework. But I suspect that were I to integrate that in, that it would um, it, it would fall in a way. Maybe it could be reframed in a, in a certain way. But thank you for the comment. <laughs> 
Great. We have a question from uh, Natalie McLean. Um, conceptually, how does the framework consider dynamics regarding the growing presence of private sector involvement in disaster and complex emergencies? For example, private military and security companies as armed escorts and entities such as Team Rubicon, veterans working in disaster response under the framing of humanitarian response and assistance. Right, very important point. Thank you for raising it. Um, uh, yes, that, that is absolutely um, uh, something that I should have mentioned when I was talking about the sort of the, the definition of humanitarian military relations and what are the types of organized armed actors that we're talking about in this space. Um, but absolutely private military and security companies, um, uh, many interviews I spoke to, we're talking about the use of them um, as armed escorts um, and the differing challenging dynamics of that, especially when they they might have some political associations in the context uh, where they're working. Um, uh, and the, my paper talks about it as well, but um, that's just to say that yes, uh, PMSCs are certainly important um, actors in this space as well. Uh, there's a question uh, specific, I guess, to Australia. After the devastating bushfires earlier this year in Australia, there was a suggestion to create a disaster relief dis reserve force within the Australian Defence Force. Thoughts on that? And this comes from Derek Tin. Um, sorry, I'm just reading the uh, question here. Uh, so the, the question is about the idea of a disaster relief reserve force within the Australian Defense Force. Um, so I don't know this case very well, so I don't know if there are particular dynamics of this that I'm uh, not aware of, but um, uh, you know, my sense is that um, this would be a welcome development if there's a devotion on the, on the military side to um, have a specialized unit for a disaster response. Um, uh, that is getting away from uh, what I saw as a lot of the challenges that interviews expressed to me, which is situations where <clears throat> you have some military actors that are working on a response, um, but they don't necessarily have a humanitarian background. So in many ways, many interviewees talked about the challenge from the mil military side is how can you uh, uh, capacitate military actors so that um, your uh, not having a situation where uh, people are put into roles that they're not sufficiently prepared for. So my uh, uh, my gut reaction is that uh, something to that effect would be a welcome development that would mitigate that challenge. Thanks, Rob. So um, I actually have a question for you. Um, over the past six months, we've seen an explosion of civil military humanitarian coordination as nearly every country on earth has used a combination of humanitarian NGOs, civilian government agencies, and military units in their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Now the data collection for your project, of course, was carried out pre-COVID, but what lessons can be drawn from your research that may apply to civil military coordination during the current pandemic? Or what new lessons are COVID teaching us about civil military coordination in actual practice? Yeah, so um, to me, uh, I'm not sure if there are new lessons uh, particularly, or if there are new challenges that have been illuminating, but rather what I see is more another manifestation of challenges that we've seen uh, in uh, other contexts. Like I said in the presentation, um, the use of military forces in a um, disease outbreak um, stretches back to the 1800s um, and, and um, earlier. But I'll say, you know, it's, it's the one issue that we see is the issue I just mentioned that you have, um, uh, in some cases, military actors working on the response that actually um, have not, do not have the background to, uh, to undertake the response. They don't understand the nuances and, and dynamics of what is required in responding to an outbreak. Um, and we see problems arise. Uh, but additionally, I can say, you know, um, especially in some of the work we're doing here at Brown moving forward, um, one of the contexts we're looking at is, is the Philippines and the COVID response in the Philippines. 
um, which is a case where it's the, the response has become very uh, uh, militarized. We have the military and the police force involved in enforcing uh, quarantines. You have uh, a large number of arrests. Um, you have some political pushback, human rights pushback because of the concerns about detainee, detainee abuses. Um, and this is exactly what you don't want in a, um, in a pandemic response is the response to be uh, relying on armed actors in a way that exacerbates the political situation, exacerbates human rights issues, and um, uh, exacerbates um, uh, people's humanitarian needs. Because I mean, in that case, and, and in others, people are unable to um, uh, get the uh, health services and, and food that they need to survive. Um, so in that, that sort of is how I see the, the challenge is both operationally and strategically how to implement a response in a way that um, addresses the issue, uh, supports people in, in getting what they need, um, as opposed to in, in some way um, exacerbating the situation, exacerbating the needs and exacerbating political tensions. We have a, a question from Paul Shuri as well. Some nations are linking CIMIC and influence activities together. What impact do you think this has on the framework? Ah, that's interesting. Um, I, that's something I need to think about and I'd be interested to talk about it more. So I don't necessarily have a reaction to it, um, but um, uh, that is a good comment that I will, I will uh, be ruminating on. So thank you for, thank you for that comment. Um, we have another question from Andrea Cameron. The 3C spectrum derives from humanitarian values shaping the operating environment. Will more complex emergencies and, and protracted, with more complex emergencies and protracted crises, do you find that humanitarians may be more willing to co cooperate with militaries for access, security, and protection? Uh, yes, so yeah, that's, that is what I, what I did uh, see at least cooperate um, on those issues of access security and and protection um, that's the you know the 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 logic of the two dimensional framework that i that I put out is that um, in in a complex emergency cooperation is required for access and can be required for security and also uh, protection as well. Um, so it kind of turns the three C's framework on its head a little bit in that in a complex emergency, we see that there's a need for, a, for greater cooperation, that you do see a greater level of cooperation. Might, be, might not be the case, you know, uh, in all instances across the board, but that seems to be the, the trend um, that I observed. But um, it did still seem to be the case that when it comes to military involvement in uh, HADR in a complex emergency, um, that, that still does, in, it can introduce uh, challenging and problematic dynamics uh, for humanitarians retaining their humanitarian identity in complex emergencies. But, um, but yes, I absolutely, to answer the question, I absolutely do see um, that cooperation increases on those three areas of access, security, and protection. Thanks. Um, so I guess for our final question here, um, again, comes back to us from Down Under, Mons Wellander, your comment regarding the Australian National Armed Forces establishing a relief brigade. What then would increasing the mandate of military uh, for doing relief work i.e. blurring the distinction of civilian and humanitarian mandates, what impact would that have on the perception of humanitarian organizations and their neutrality? And I guess this gets to kind of a bigger question than just uh, Australian Relief Forces uh, battling wildfires, but just more generally this issue um, of uh, perceived uh, neutrality of humanitarian actors or the lack of it when they are interacting with military actors. Yeah, um, it's a good question and actually uh, it sort of links to some other 
uh, discussions that have been happening over the course of this summer. I spoke on um, a, a web panel that was questioning the very idea of whether humanitarians should strive to be neutral and what the, um, what the dynamics of that uh, might be. Um, but essentially, what I think your question brings up for me is the fact that uh, military actors are engaging in humanitarian response um, in various ways. We see it all over the world in different types of, of contexts. Um, so um, to me, it seems like that's a, a reality that is not going to go away and that should not go away because of the fact that they have assets and, and capacities that are very useful in humanitarian response. Um, but at the same time, as your question highlights, it does bring up this issue if militaries are involved, um, in what way is it uh, neutral and how can humanitarian organizations retain that neutrality? Um, I personally see humanitarian organizations struggling a bit with this issue of, uh, of neutrality and how they can actually be neutral if they are dependent on military or other types of armed actors for various dimensions of their response, whether it's um, armed escorts um, or, uh, you, know, it, you know, the use of military assets. Um, to me, my personal sense is that neutrality, neutrality itself seems a bit under threat in these, in these various dimensions, but there's a bit of a pushback, a, another side of the discourse that is questioning whether neutrality is something that humanitarians should actually seek to retain or if it's just some sort of a fiction that we're pretending to, to retain. So I, I see a big complexity in, in, the, uh, in the realm of neutrality as a humanitarian principle. Well, thank you, Rob, for joining us here today and for your presentation. Um, Again, for those who haven't uh, read it yet, all of you have been sent a copy of Rob's excellent report. Please uh, take the time to read it, and we'll also be posting it on our CHRHS website uh, very soon after this uh, symposium. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob and Adam. So our next speaker we're very excited to hear from is Sangeetha Yogendran. She is a global fellow at Brown University's Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies. She is a, also a PhD fellow at the Human Rights Center, Faculty of Law and Criminology at the University of Ghent, where she is currently working on the ERC funded project, Writing Victim Participation in Transitional Justice. Sangeetha is a qualified advocate and solicitor in Singapore and she holds an LLM in Public International Law from the University of Melbourne. She also holds an LLB with honors from the National University of Singapore. And her presentation today, I wanna make sure I, I note this, is uh, pre-recorded due to some bandwidth issues. So we have an excellent uh, copy that we were able to record. It's just under 30 minutes long, but the great news is she is with us live. And so she will be taking your questions uh, immediately following the presentation. So thank you, Sangeetha, for being here. And Seth and Brown's IR information team, you can kick that off whenever you're ready. Dave, just give me a thumbs up if the audio comes through clear. Hi, a very good morning or good day to you, wherever you're based in the world. My name is Sangeeta Yogendran, and I'm one of the research consultants that's been working with Brown's Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies on this exciting research project to expand the evidence base for civil and military coordination in humanitarian response. In particular, I have been looking at the responsibility of states that are indirectly involved in an armed conflict to provide medical care. I've titled my report, A Contemporary Challenge for the Classification of Armed Conflict. The research question I'm specifically looking at today is what is the legal responsibility of states that are indirectly involved in an armed conflict 
to provide medical care for affected civilians and combatants in a conflict setting under the Geneva Conventions and International Humanitarian Law. I will also be looking at what national responsibility a state undertakes when working in a coalition with other actors. Now, in order to determine the legal responsibility of a state indirectly involved in an armed conflict, several fundamental questions arise. The research I'm presenting here today is organized in order to address some of these fundamental questions first, before looking into the possible parameters for the provision of medical care and what that could look like. Some of the questions will include, um, and will be addressed in order, when is a state or non-state um, armed group a party to the conflict? Secondly, if found a party to the conflict, what are the obligations and responsibilities under international humanitarian law that arise? Thirdly, if found to be a party to the conflict and therefore obligations and responsibilities are applicable, what exactly constitutes the provision of medical care for affected civilians and combatants? In order to do so, the first thing we're going to do is to look into defining the legal framework. In doing this, we're going to be looking at quite a few sources of international law, firstly concentrating on international humanitarian law under which the Geneva Conventions fall. I'll often be referring to this as IHL, which I'm sure everyone is very familiar with by this point. I'll also be looking at customary international law, the laws of state responsibility, and human rights law. Um, it's going to become fairly apparent that the questions posed in the slide before actually leads to a complication of the legal framework. It's not that clear because it exposes a gap in the, protec in the protections that the law affords non-combatants or civilians in a conflict setting. So we will first move on to international humanitarian law. Under international humanitarian law, there are three possible conflict settings that we can consider. An international armed conflict, IAC, as is often referred to, a non-international armed conflict, NIAC, or a third situation, which is peacetime, i.e. the lack of a conflict. Now, according to the definitions of an IAC, it is defined as an armed conflict between two or more states, with the emphasis on states, and it applies to all cases of declared war or any other armed conflict, even if the state of war has not been recognized by the high contracting parties to it. On the other hand, we have NIAC, which is defined to exist when there is a protracted armed violence between government authorities, state authorities, and organized armed groups, or between such groups within a state and is governed by international humanitarian law as well. Peacetime, as a third uh, situation, where there's no active conflict, is often governed by international human rights law, which we will also be looking into. Now, as we start looking into international humanitarian law, we will clearly be focusing heavily on the, the Geneva Conventions and their additional protocols. Arguably, the GECs and their additional protocols form the core of international humanitarian law, and this regulates the conduct of armed conflict and seeks to limit its effects, which encompass broad duties for all states to abide by the rules of the conventions, as well as, to take, as, well as the duty to take all necessary measures to ensure, to ensure safeguarding compliance with the conventions for those who are parties to a conflict. Now, one of the first core provisions we will be looking at today is Common Article 1, which obliges parties to ensure respect for international humanitarian law. It's a fairly quite brief, as you can see, and I've reproduced it in whole here. It states that the high contracting parties undertake to respect and to ensure, ensure respect for the present convention in all circumstances. Now, this is actually a very broad obligation if you think about it and it's quite vaguely worded. So we're going to try and look into this a bit further. Um, the fact that it's a common article to all four Geneva, con the fact that it's a common article refers to the fact that it's present in all four Geneva Conventions. Now, common article one creates a two-sided obligation for the contracting parties because each state is obliged to ensure compliance with the conventions, firstly within their own jurisdictions, but also and irrespective of any direct engagement with an armed conflict, each state is also obliged to do everything that is reasonably in its power to ensure that IHL is also respected by all. 
So common article one actually in this way creates a positive obligation on all states, including third parties to an armed conflict. Now this positive obligation is generally understood to not be construed as an obligation to reach a specific result, but rather as an obligation of means. What do we mean by an obligation of means? It's, to take that it's for states to take all appropriate measures, to po measures possible to try and end any grave breaches of international humanitarian law. Now, arguably, um, when Common Article 1 was first drafted and adopted, it was not intended to confer an external dimension to the obligation for state parties to ensure respect for the four Geneva Conventions. However, today, one could argue that it does actually contain an external dimension and therefore carries with it a proper legal obligation for states to take measures to induce compliance with international humanitarian law by other states. Some authors have also argued that Common Article 1 requires third states to take measures to ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions, even if this means, in practice, Ironically, that this provision is one of the most violated norms of international humanitarian law. Some authors have also stated that this obligation to ensure respect, as it's been enshrined in Common Article 1, includes an obligation for states to adopt measures to induce other states to comply with international humanitarian law in case of a breach. Now, we've covered Common Article 1 to the Geneva Conventions. We're now going to turn to other relevant articles in the Geneva Conventions applicable to our research question today. We will start by also looking at Common Article 3, which is more applicable to situations of a non-international armed conflict. As stated in Common Article 3, in the situation of a non-international armed con conflict, occurring in the territory of one of the contracting parties to the Geneva Conventions, each party is then bound to the following responsibilities as a minimum. The first one is the protection of civilians and hors de combat, who are people who have laid down their arms. The second is the prohibition on violence to life and person, the taking of hostages, outrages upon personal dignity, and the passing of sentences and the carrying out of executions without due process. Common Article 3.2 in particular states that the wounded and sick shall be collected and cared for. This particular obligation, Common Article 3.2, brings it squarely within our research question for those that are parties to the conflict. Therefore, as long as a country or a party is determined to be a party to the conflict for the purposes of our research, they would then bear the responsibility of collecting and caring for the wounded and sick in the situation of a non-international armed conflict. Now, there are also several other applicable Geneva Convention articles that we would like to mention here. The first is Article 12 of the First Geneva Convention, which protects members of the armed forces who are wounded or sick and states that they shall be respected and protected in all circumstances, including ensuring that they are treated humanely and cared for. We will also briefly touch upon Article 24 of Geneva Convention 1 as well, which addresses the protection of permanent medical personnel. We now move to the issue of customary international law. Now, where the Geneva Conventions and additional protocols bind only parties to a conflict to the obligations contained therein, as we've seen right before these, these customary norms can be a source of obligation for states who are not found to be directly involved in any international humanitarian law, armed conflict by international humanitarian law standards. My apologies. Now, as we already talked about above, we're going to revisit Common Article 1 because it commits states to respect and ensure respect for the Geneva Conventions and recognizes the importance of adopting all reasonable measures to ensure that violations can be prevented. Now, this is the prevailing view that's been adopted for the interpretation of Common Article 1 and was already expressed in Pictet's commentary to the GCs as way back as 1952 and has also been supported by the International Committee of the Red Cross. Developments in customary international law have also since affirmed this view. Particularly, the International Court of Justice has affirmed this commitment in all circumstances by stating, since such an obligation does not derive only from the conventions themselves, but from the general principles of humanitarian law to which the conventions merely give specific expression. So this has kind of cemented Common Article, common article 1 status as a customary rule of international humanitarian law.
in looking for other customary rules of international humanitarian law, we actually turned to the ICRC's database of 161 rules of customary IHL. This is an incredibly useful database, but we will in particular be focusing on three applicable rules. So the first rule I would like to highlight for today is Rule 55, which states that parties to the conflict must allow and facilitate rapid and unimpeded passage of humanitarian relief for civilians in need, which is impartial in character and conducted without any adverse distinction subject to their right of control. This is similar to what we talked about earlier as the obligation mentioned in Article 23 of Geneva, the Fourth Geneva Convention, wherein each high contracting party should allow for the free passage of all consignments of medical and hospital stores. It can be argued that the humanitarian relief to reach civilians in need, as well as medical care for civilians and combatants in a conflict setting, could fall within this obligation, although it is not expressly stated as such. However, this rule in itself is not an active responsibility to provide for the medical care, but it is an obligation to not impede such relief where it is already being provided for. So in that sense, Rule 55 arguably could be tied in with the responsibility and the obligation to provide medical care, but it is not explicitly stated as such. We also look to Rule 110, which obliges parties to a conflict, again, parties to a conflict, to provide medical care and attention to the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked to the fullest extent possible and with the least possible delay. Now, this obligation to provide such medical care and, atten and attention with the least possible delay should be read together with Rule 109, which comes just before it, which states that wherever the circumstances allow, especially after an engagement, each party of the conflict must, without delay, take all possible measures to search for, collect, and evacuate the wounded, sick, and shipwrecked without any adverse distinction. Thirdly, I've highlighted on the screen Rule 25, which states that medical personnel who are exclusively assigned to medical duties must be respected and protected in all circumstances, and they lose their protection if they commit acts disproportionately harmful to any belligerent. So these are the three rules that we've highlighted here, which are the most applicable to the provision of medical care to affected civilians and combatants in a conflict setting. So it's quite apparent from this that while the obligations that we've laid out above are quite clear when they come to the provision of medical services, this again applies to parties to a conflict only. Again, what is missing is how such obligations, if at all, would apply to non-parties or in this case in particular with this research question, those parties that are indirectly involved in an armed conflict. Now, as mentioned before, when we were talking about international humanitarian law and customary international law, some norms of international humanitarian law have attained customary international law status or use Kogan status. The same applies to international human rights law. So both IHL and IHRL have norms that are use Kogan's norms. Now, when adopting the approach that certain key principles of human rights law apply concurrently with international human, humanitarian law, even during an armed conflict or occupation, such use Kogan's norms would apply universally and create rights and obligations that by their very nature are the concern of all states. In other words, they create rights and obligations ergo omnes. States have an interest in the protection of such rights. However, if they are use Kogan's norms, this places additional duties on states regarding their promotion, respect, and implementations. So when an erga omnis violation has occurred, third states that may not be directly involved in the conflict have the right to demand that the wrongful act ceases. There are also other avenues for third states for example, they have the right to demand reparation for the benefits of the victims affected by this erga omnis violation. Third states are also bound to cooperate with each other and with the parties to the conflict to end such serious breaches through lawful means, as well as refraining from recognizing the unlawful situation or from providing assistance to the offending state. Now, there remains a lot of debate about the applicability of both international humanitarian law and international human rights law from scholars and states that argue for the lex specialis nature of IHL. The lex specialis nature specifically means 
the more specific rules of international humanitarian law will prevail over the more general rules of international human rights law, and therefore displacing international human rights law entirely during times of armed conflict. Now, this is quite confusing, and for clarity, we look to other sources, such as the International Court of Justice, which has um, issued opinions on this, albeit two slightly differing ones. In the court's later advisory opinion on the Palestinian wall case, it stated that there were three possible situations for this relationship between international humanitarian law and human rights law. The first is that some rights can be exclusively matters of international humanitarian laws, and others may be exclusively matters of international human rights law. That's the second situation. And then the third would be that others may be matters of both these branches of law. The ICRC supports the approach that international humanitarian law constitutes the lex specialis governing the assessment of lawfulness when it comes to the use of force against lawful targets in IACs, and notes that the interplay between humanitarian law and international human rights law, specifically on the use of force, is less clear in a non-international armed conflict. So in situations where the threshold for armed conflict has not been reached, international humanitarian law is no longer applicable. However, that does not mean that there's no regime under international law that does not provide obligations for parties to a conflict to provide for potential medical care for those affected. We've already seen that where the threshold for armed conflict has been reached, regardless of whether the parties to the conflict are states or non-state armed groups, IHL applies. However, where this threshold has not been reached, states are still obligated under international human rights law. However, the one issue with this is that it would not apply to non-state armed groups as international humanitarian law as a regime is sorry, international human rights law as a regime is premised on states as the key rights holders and therefore protectors. Now, the draft articles on state responsibility have codified or attempted to codify the customary international law of state responsibility. So we looked at customary international law for international humanitarian law and human rights law briefly. We are now looking to um, customary international law for state responsibility as another possible avenue to figure out rights and responsibilities and obligations for our research question. Now the draft articles have identified three instances where a state can be held directly responsible for the acts of another. The first contained in Article 16 is that of rendering aid or assistance. The second in Article 17 is effective control over the perpetrator. And the third in Article 18 is exercising co coercion as per Article 18. We can also look to Article 41, which states that states are bound by a duty to cooperate, to bring to an end the wrongful situation at hand, a duty to refrain from recognizing the wrongful situation, and a duty to refrain from rendering aid or assistance in maintaining that wrongful situation. So you can see the similarities with the three articles mentioned above. Article 16, read together with Article 41, actually makes it very clear that a state can only be held responsible for aid or assistance for the internationally wrongful act of another only if it has actual and specific knowledge of the circumstances in which the aid or assistance it is providing is intended to be used. So the question here is, is if the provision of medical care for affected civilians and combatants, would it be considered such an obligation? And in which case would it apply to it's fairly clear the obligations that apply when a party is found to be a party to an armed conflict. Now we're going to look to what happens um, when parties are working together in coalition with each other through coalition forces or multinational forces. When it comes to states acting in coalition with other actors, the question that we need to ask and determine is when a party in a coalition or multinational force becomes a party to an armed conflict. I think I've talked and repeated quite extensively that this is quite a fundamental question that needs to be addressed first. Working in conjunction with other actors does not directly equate to a party becoming a direct party to a conflict. So this is not automatically given. While multinational forces do not direct, uh, may be involved to varying degrees, not every kind of involvement automatically renders a state a party to the conflict. Multinational forces can become a party to a non-international conflict if they become engaged in a conflict 
with a non-state AM group that meets the usual requirements for such a classification. Now, this doesn't make it explicitly clear, so we've turned to other sources to determine when a party in a coalition becomes a party to an armed conflict. Both the ICRC and RULAC have provided um, support on this through their support-based approach to determine whether a country or a party in a multinational force becomes a party to that armed conflict. Now, the ICRC has determined that a multinational force's contribution to the collective conduct of hostilities is the, is the determining factor as to whether or not they would become a party to a pre-existing non-international armed conflict. Only activities that have a direct impact on the opposing party's ability to carry out military operations would turn a multinational force into a party to a pre-existing non-international armed conflict. However, the ICRC finds that other forms of support to sustain military activities or to build up military capabilities, such as the delivery of weapons, would not necessarily be sufficient to determine whether that party or state becomes a party to a pre-existing non-international armed conflict. Now, the rationale for this support-based approach is to link international humanitarian law to multinational forces and their actions that form an integral part of the pre-existing conflict. So the highlight here is that it needs to form an integral part to the pre-existing conflict. Multinational forces support should not be interpreted as a constitutive, a constitutive element of a potential new and independent non-international armed conflict. Therefore, because of this nexus with the pre-existing non-international armed conflict, the support provided by multinational forces must be distinguished from what is required to establish that they are party to a distinct non-international armed conflict. Now, we've seen or we understand that support can take several forms and can be of varying levels of intensity. The ICRC has clarified that situations that involve financial or political support are not necessarily included in constitu constituting support and therefore becoming a party to the conflict and undertaking certain responsibilities. Why? Because these types of assistance have no bearing on the application of international humanitarian law. However, we've seen that this may have implications in terms of the law of state responsibility. Now, it is at this juncture that we have to acknowledge that this gap in determining, determining who is a party to an armed conflict in a multinational force is one of the several contemporary challenges for the classification of armed conflicts. The rule of law in armed conflicts, which is supported by the Geneva Academy, also similarly um, provides a support-based approach, as has been elaborated by the ICRC. Now, the issue of international humanitarian law and how it applies to multinational forces has been the subject of debate for a long time. This is especially so given the several large coalitions that have participated in armed conflicts to date, such as we have seen in both Iraq and Afghanistan. When it comes to United Nations forces, the UN has agreed that when peace support operations are actively engaged in combat, the provisions of international humanitarian law apply to the extent and for the duration of this engagement. Now, as with any other situation where the Geneva Conventions and other sources of international humanitarian law do not explicitly state so, the applicability of international humanitarian law to a multinational force must be determined solely on the basis of the facts, irrespective of the international mandate assigned to a multinational force by an international, regional, or national authority. Now, another aspect that we would like to turn to is that of attribution, to determine the responsibilities of a parties to a conflict, especially so when coalition forces are involved. Now, to assess the attribution of concrete acts to the international organization or the troop coordinating country would depend on the general rules of attribution under international, human, international law. This, in turn, revolves around the notion of control. Therefore, the responsibility falling on both the individual troop contributing country and the organization or dual attribution would indeed be possible. The assumption here then is that the regional and international organization in and of themselves, and presumably where they have the capacity to do so, can be responsible for this provision of medical care for affected civilians and combatants in a conflict setting. Also using the notion of control to determine whether international humanitarian law is applicable has legal implications because a non-state party could then become subordinate to the intervening third party. In international law, 
members of this non-state armed group can therefore be considered to be agents of the third party. Finally, before I conclude, we will briefly turn to precedent. Now, looking at precedent, one of the examples I will be turning to would be the Battle of Mosul in Iraq between October 2016 and July 27. This battle demonstrated again that parties to the conflict had obligations and responsibilities to provide medical care and support affected civilians and combatants. Now, in a battle that saw more civilian deaths than IS fighters, did all coalition members have an obligation to provide medical care for those injured civilians and combatants? If, as found a party to the conflict, the answer here would be yes. However, where there is room for debate in this case is whether all the members of the coalition were a party to the conflict. This is because, if you look at it, the global coalition against Daesh, which was created in 2014, is currently made up of 82 partner states. Now, logically, it would be difficult to argue that all 82 states would be responsible um, for the obligation to provide medical care for injured civilians and combatants. At the time of the offensive, the US-led coalition included a dozen partner countries carrying out more than 1,250 airstrikes in Mosul alone. Now, out of these, eight, out of these um, partners, 18 of them have military manuals with language consistent to rules 109 and 110 of customary international humanitarian law that we discussed earlier, which is the obligation of means to provide medical care and attention with the least possible delay to affected civilians and combatants. Such a large coalition has resulted in the inevitable situation where some members participated in combat activities against Daesh, including the United States, the United Kingdom and France who conducted airstrikes, while many other members of the coalition did not. For example, the air forces of Australia, Canada and Germany conducted aerial reconnaissance flights and have also provided air-to-air -air refueling for the airstrikes. The Netherlands, for example, has also at times committed fighter attack aircraft to the coalition. However, the Netherlands is now more focused on capacity building, providing training that highlights the importance of human rights and humanitarian law. These examples just mentioned unfortunately show the uncertainty that comes with trying to show whether, for example, Australia, Canada, Germany and the Netherlands actively participated in combat activities. Now, while the coalition did permit medical humanitarian groups to embed with the international coalition during the offensive, how they upheld these obligations to provide medical care for affected civilians and combatants has been questioned with some arguing that the close cooperation that came from embedding medical aid groups in the offensive meant that care may not have been delivered on the basis of need alone, arguably. Now, organizing a medical response at the same time as planning a military campaign meant that a whole chain for medical referral was established alongside with the campaign. Now, I'm sure many people here are much more familiar with these campaigns, and I'd be happy to engage in a further discussion on this because based most of this research is based on um, literature review and legal research. And it'll be very interesting to hear from the many of you who I'm sure were actually involved, perhaps on the ground even. So now to conclude very briefly, we've talked a lot about legal obligations. Um, in conclusion, the obligations to provide medical support as has been contained within the Geneva Conventions is clear if you are a party to the conflict. However, it's also clear that the only the obligations are only clear if you are a party to the conflict. What is actually missing is how such obligations, if at all, would apply to non-parties, or in this case, with our research questions, those parties that are indirectly involved in an armed conflict. We have tried to address this by turning to other sources of international law, such as customary law, international human rights law, and the draft articles and state responsibility. Where there remains a gap is with non-state actors and whether they may be a party to the conflict or third parties or states that are indirectly part of a conflict but are not considered parties to that conflict, all of whom are therefore immune from the obligations contained under international humanitarian law. While we have seen that some of this can be addressed by the Geneva Conventions, there are not adequate avenues of responsibility unlike for state actors, especially when we're talking about non-state armed groups or third parties or states to a conflict. In general, the duties and responsibilities for coalition forces under international law are also relatively clear, but there definitely remains some room for interpretation 
and therefore subjectivity. Now, given the ever-changing nature of warfare and coalition forces, as was demonstrated in the example of the Global Coalition Against Daesh, there definitely needs to be clearer guidance on when states or actors would fall clearly under the obligation of being a party to the conflict, because then it is clear that they are subject to the responsibilities and obligations for the provision of medical support, as has been laid out under the Geneva Conventions. If not, state and non-state actors can use the subjectivity of many of these treaties and rules to fall short on their duty to provide aid for conflict-affected civilians at least. One would hope that this would not be the case, given that a moral duty clearly exists, but there are definite gaps in the law, and one would hope that further revisions and clarifications can actually come about, and hopefully as a result of this research. So thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to engaging with you further during the Q&A. Thank you very much, Sangeetha. And if we can have you come up, there we go. We'll start with Kave Kushnud. He's got a, a question in an armed conflict, which actors have a legal obligation to keep track of and report the number of civilian casualties? Great, thanks David and thanks Kave. Um, it's a very interesting question because um, someone please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not actually aware if this is a legal obligation for the various actors, whether they are state actors or non-state armed groups to actually keep track of the numbers and to report them. Um, I'm well aware that the UN officers and missions on the ground often do this with UN OCHA leading this, but I'm, and I think a lot of um, state actors do keep track, especially of their own um, civilian and military casualties. I'm not aware this is actually a legal obligation and it would be actually very interesting to, to make it one because perhaps, you know, that would raise a lot more awareness about the numbers and civilian and military casualties being incurred. But as far as I'm aware, it's not actually a legal obligation. So thank you for that question. Yeah, and we'll see if anybody responds to it and we can readdress it later. Yeah. The next question is from Jory Breslowski. Hopefully I pronounced your name right. Can non-state actors be held accountable without a fundamental change in how international law treats states as the main actors in, in the international community? Thanks, Jory. I think you kind of hit the nail on that head with that excellent question. Um, having non-state actors um, be held accountable would require a very significant shift in the whole international law system. As I mentioned, as far as human rights law goes, it's still very premised on states being the main actors. So therefore you have to look to either customary law or customary international humanitarian law, which does take into account non-state actors. I think the bigger issue here and that your question is actually highlighting is where is the accountability mechanism, especially if we're talking about a non-state actor. With state actors, you've got some avenues in the international law arena, the International Court of Justice, which re would require another state bringing a state to court, um, perhaps at the ICC, if you're taking certain individuals, which has been used and I think might be the most um, practical way to go about accountability for now. But you're right in the sense that because customary international law is still relatively vague and hard to therefore hold people accountable for, we are hoping or looking to a very fundamental change in how the system works if we want to, or we need the ICC system to be a lot more rigorous and perhaps more efficient in being the only possible avenue for now when it comes to non-state actors. Thank you. The next question is from Derek Tin. Are there provisions for punishment for rogue states that do not adhere to the Geneva Conventions or IHL if there are not, what then? Trade economic sanctions question. Great, thanks Derek. And I think this flows on quite nicely with the question that Jory brought up as well in terms of the accountability mechanism. So there are quite a few um, available on the international legal scene, again, with the ICJ being an option, but that would require another state actor to bring, you know, for example, that rogue state, if we wanna call them that, to the International Court of Justice, we can also then have either through state referrals or the ICC prosecutor's referral or UN Security Council referral to the International Criminal Court. The issue there is that you're not going to be holding a whole rogue state accountable. You're looking at only specific individuals. That also begs the question of, you know, how many individuals is even feasible? And often you're looking at perhaps the, those who are the most responsible. I think a very good 
um, option that you've alluded to, the question would be bilaterally or even regionally with perhaps trade and economic sanctions that I think we've seen a lot of so far. Um, NATO, for example, might be an example of a regional grouping where you could have some of those trade or economic sanctions. I think we've seen a lot of examples today with several countries in the Middle East um, where economic sanctions have proven to be effective. There is, of course, a flip side to that argument about how effective they can be and how many civilians are unnecessarily affected by this. So for now, I think you have to stick to either the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, or the several um, human rights mechanisms before the UN. Again, the enforceability of that will always be a question. Thank you. Uh, Michael Boyce has a follow on to Derek's question that you just answered. In the event that such a state does not adhere, and I think you got into this a little bit, but I'll still read it. In, in the event that a state does not adhere to these obligations with respect to humanitarian access, how far do other states' duties to promote extend? And he gives a nice example. If did Security Council members have an obligation to support the cross border delivery of aid to Syria when the Syrian government refused to grant access? Great, thank you, Michael. And I think that example is a very um, perfect example to kind of demonstrate this point. And I kind of touched on this a bit with the information about Common Article 1. As it was envisioned at the very beginning, I don't think it was meant to you know, extend such a positive um, obligation on states. But now, arguably, you could say that the obligation to promote and ensure respect for the conventions would actually mean that um, states could actually go quite far in terms of ensuring that they take positive actions to ensure this. Again, with the draft articles on state responsibility, you are also ensuring that you're, well, you're not supposed to be aiding a situation where wrongfully com an act that's wrongfully being committed um, is, being, is occurring and you want to make sure that as a state you're not aiding that. So I think the most likely thing is to construe common article one as quite a positive obligation for example, I think in the Syrian example that you've given, Security Council members could arguably have had that obligation to support such a cross-border delivery of aid, um, given that the Syrian government was refusing to grant access. So I think there's a lot here to argue that in that setting, when you're dealing with governments that are refusing to grant access, other third countries involved have the obligation to actually push for this so that medical aid can be rendered to civilians. Excellent. We have one from Yanni Bach. It's if the armed actors have a legal obligation to allow for unrestricted access for humanitarian relief organizations, is there anything that would limit the ability of military actors to themselves oversee, create, fund, etc., humanitarian offices? And he gives an example of the earlier question regarding a proposed Australian initiative or even the short-lived Hope for proposal um, from Qatar a few years back. Um, I think that's quite interesting because if you look at the obligations contained in the Geneva Conventions, you could logically argue that there would be no reason to not have um, a military actor themselves have a humanitarian office. I think, again, this depends on the reliability of that. And then we go into um, what Rob was speaking about in the earlier presentation about that objectivity and neutrality, because if you look solely at the IHL obligations, you need to be able to do this without distinction um, and have no you know, bias in that sense when you're providing this support and medical care. So I think in that sense, there shouldn't be a, a, a reason to not have military actors kind of have a humanitarian office embedded within them. But again, that would be a situation where you would have to be able to guarantee that these military actors could do so and provide humanitarian aid, not just to you know, the people on their side of the conflict, if I can simplify. Thank you. And we'll see, we'll see if we have time for one more. This could be our last one. Uh, and Sarah went to one I was definitely going to ask about if I was going to have time for a question. Regarding the Mosul case study, can you please restate your conclusions on this? What should the U.S. or Iraqi forces have done differently according to the legal obligations? So this is an interesting example. Again, having just um, done a literature review on this, so I'd be very happy and genuinely curious to know from people a lot more involved in this, as I'm sure many of you are. Um, I think the argument for the Mosul case study that a lot of literature was making was that there was still a lot of um, civilian casualties with this, probably due to the nature of the airstrikes. And 
it would have been, it should have been a situation where I think provision of medical care would have been perhaps more, more efficient and not a situation where it was, some of it was embedded within some forces because that led to some critique of how objective the um, provision of medical aid was and whether it was only towards parties or towards um, actors that were more on that particular side of the conflict, if you will. And again, I think this is something that I would be very happy to learn a lot more about and something I actually hope to elaborate, in, elaborate on more. I'm not just in the report, but going further because again, with a literature review, you find a lot of varying and very strong opinions on this particular issue. Thank you, Sangeetha. So we're gonna pause here. There are some, actually some excellent questions in the Q&A that we will get to you so that you can get back to people with your thoughts, but we really appreciate it. Everyone, we're gonna take a 15 minute break and we will reconvene at 10 a.m. Eastern time with Chris Quadja. He'll be talking about community perceptions of military involvement and pandemic response in Northeast Nigeria. Thank you all so much. We will see you in 15 minutes. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully all of you had a restful break. We're gonna go ahead and continue with our next presentation. For that, we are very excited to have Dr. Chris Quadja, who is a senior lecturer and researcher at the Center for Peace and Security Studies at Modibo Adama University of Technology in Nigeria. He is also a visiting research fellow with the Center for Democracy and Development and a global center and a global fellow of our own Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies at Brown. He holds a doctorate degree in international relations and strategic studies from the University of Jos in Nigeria, and his research focuses on the politics of identity in Africa, the privatization of security, democratization, conflict, and peace studies, as well as security sector reform and transition societies. We actually have a pre recorded uh, version of his presentation that we will be showing to you due to some current technical difficulties in Nigeria related to a rainstorm. However, we hope that uh, Chris will be able to join us right after the pre recorded presentation to answer your questions live. So without further ado, we will go ahead with his presentation. Thank you. It's a pleasure joining you today uh, for this uh, very important occasion, uh, which is uh, on civil military coordination and humanitarian response, expanding the evidence base. Uh, first, I want to thank Brown University and uh, specifically our, my appreciation goes to uh, Adam Levin and uh, Seth Stulen for the opportunity they gave us, myself and Dan Oliveri. Uh, we are the researchers for this particular a presentation on community perception of military involvement in epidemic response in the Northeast region of Nigeria, implications for civil military relations. Uh, just to uh, say this presentation uh, is, was conducted in, the, the research was conducted in Nigeria with specific focus on the Northeast region. And uh, as we continue the presentation, you will uh, see the justification as to why the Northeast region of Nigeria was picked as against other regions in the country. The presentation starts with three interesting quotes from the field, uh, from the respondents that we interviewed in the field regarding their perception of military involvement in epidemic response in the context of the Northeast uh, region of Nigeria. The first was from a community leader in uh, the Northeast, particularly Yola, Adama State. He said, my initial view of the Nigerian military has been one that views it as an institution that is made up of men and women that are trained to fight on behalf of the country with their involvement in providing medical assistance to civilians. My ignorance about what the military represents has been altered. The other quotation came from the military officer in Maiduguri, Borno State. Right now, Borno State is the epicenter of insurgency in Nigeria. For Adamawa and Yobe, we've seen a decline in the frequency and intensity of deadly attacks uh, in these two states, unlike Borno, where 
uh, the, the insurgents are still uh, actively involving some deadly attacks against communities as well as uh, the Nigerian state. So a military officer in, in, in Medugri Borno State said, through our involvement in the provision of medical support to victims of insurgency in the northeast region of Nigeria, we were able to win the hearts and minds of the people. This is one way of using the soft approach to gain the confidence of the people during times of conflict. The last but not the least quotation came from a military officer at the military headquarters in Abuja, and the military headquarters coordinates all the military response uh, in the context of insurg fight against insurgency in Nigeria. He said, when you see the military involved in pandemic response or any health-related issue in the country, and the Northeast region in particular, it is in line with our constitutional mandate under what is referred to as military aid to civil authorities, MACA, related to the disaster management and humanitarian assistance not involving the use of fire arms. Unlike military aid to, military, to, to civil power, which involves the use of kinetic force, uh, aid to civil authority involves the use of kinetic force, particularly uh, the humanitarian assistance operations, which the military is largely involved in, that focus on the protection of civilians as well as some other uh, immediate protection measures that civilian community, civilian communities require. Um, in terms of the introduction, uh, what we did in, in the introduction is to, pro, is, is, to, is to provide a context within which this study uh, was uh, conducted. Uh, first is to appreciate the location where this the, this research was conducted uh, that for over a decade the northeast region of nigeria has been plagued by violence perpetrated by the um, by the armed group known as jamatu Hill suna leader white while jihad jazz popularly known as boko haram the humanitarian crisis in this region has affected 29.6 million people with 2.2 million people internally displaced and over 190,000 people flee that fled to the Jer Chad and Cameroon as refugees and one problem that these vulnerable communities face is the outbreak of infectious diseases since many of the health facilities many of the infrastructure that are supposed to provide all the basic services that communities require have been broken down, they become vulnerable. vulnerable. And one of the ways to measure to see this vulnerability is in the spread of infectious diseases. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control and the National Disaster Response Plan uh, were, were, were key instruments through which uh, the whole issue of coordination and, uh, com and the development of comprehensive strategy to deal with internal emergency in Nigeria can be appreciated. Within the framework of the NDRP, the military was identified as very central to the success of emergency coordination and response in Nigeria. And despite common goal, the common goals recognized by both military and civilian entities, uh, there are several gaps uh, that are evident in the context of civil military coordination in epidemic response, which we'll see in this research. Examples of, of, of some of such uh, include misunderstanding of the role of the military, frustrations regarding various human rights abuses within the military, and a lack of community trust in the military. Other challenges to civil military coordination include confusion about the military's role, cultural barriers and human rights violations. Structures that promote civilian cooperation include civil society inclusion, military public health outreach, as well as improved human rights in the context of civil military reporting and channeling. Now, we also tried to look at the literature on civil military engagements during pandemic uh, epidemic response. Uh, current literature on community perceptions of military involvement in health crisis response, mm -hmm. typically focus on the effectiveness of the military and multinational actors. And by multinational actors here, we are talking about both those actors that operate even within a nation, but that there are the multiplicity of actors that, or that, 
that that are very that are very active uh, in the context of epidemic response outside the military. Scholars have also debated whether shaping the response through the lens of securitization is appropriate, given the obvious medical and public health implications of epidemic response. Some scholars even suggest that government, that military or government-led campaigns against outbreaks and epidemics have been a relatively recent phenomenon. And the situation in Sierra Leone uh, and even Liberia uh, underscores this point uh, in the context of how the military in these countries uh, have well, 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 ha ha had to confront huge challenge of dealing with the spread of Ebola. But respondents in the well, 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 all noted uh, the Liberia, like, for instance, uh, the military's use of intimidation, violence, and lack of effectiveness when helping to construct public health facilities or even responding to some of the emergency situations uh, that relates to health uh, in, 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 in Liberia specifically. And this is also because of the fact that the whole issue around military involvement in pandemic or epidemic response is one phenomenon that is really new in the context of how uh, states and, their, and, the, and institutions like the military are involved in the fight against, I mean, in, in, in responding uh, to health-related emergency. In terms of the, the methodology for this research, uh, the aim of the research was to assess civilian perception and interaction with Nigeria military's involvement in epi epidemic response are uh, using insights from the military and civilian population. Uh, we were able to identify a broad, a wide range of, 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 of respondents uh, that, we, that we interviewed both for the KII and the FGD. And the, 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 the interviews were framed around specific research questions that has to do with the role of the military in pandemic response, understanding some of the existing structures and mechanisms that engender the acceptance of the civilian community in relation to the involvement of the military in epidemic response, specific constraints that make it difficult for the civilian community to support the military in relation to its involvement in epidemic response, some of the guiding principles that define military involvement in epidemic response, some of the existing challenges that affect cooperation and coordination between the civilian community and the military in relation to epidemic response. Also, some of the constraints associated with the military's involvement in epidemic response and how they can be addressed, as well as uh, some way, the ways and to what extent do local contexts influence or impact on the involvement of the military in epidemic response. And lastly, what are those, what are some of those effective ways of engendering battles between the civilian population, the civilian and the military population in the context of epidemic response in the region. In terms of the study population and selection of respondents, uh, Adama, Burno, and Yobe were selected as the three focal states for this research, and they are all in the Northeast region. From the introduction, you can see uh, the, the explanation we provided in terms of the huge humanitarian crisis that the devil these three states and what makes them really important as key areas of focus. And uh, uh, the military has a, specific, a significant and active presence in each of these states due to its role in fighting Boko Haram insurgency, as well as the resources it has de they have deployed to support civilians affected by the violence or the insurgency. Within each state also, three local governments most directly affected by the Boko Haram insurgency were selected to determine the perception of Nigerian military involvement in both the Boko Haram insurgency and other forms of uh, of, of emergency. Uh, we, we try to ask questions about Ebola, though Ebola was not as uh, not so rampant in that in that area, but even their understanding of Ebola, uh, the Ebola epidemic uh, is one major issue in terms of helping us understand whether there are lessons from the Ebola uh, epidemic that uh, could that 
that's that really uh, shaped the way their understanding of the military involvement in epidemic uh, response in this state. In terms of so the local government selected included Madagascar, Limichika, and Yola, not in Adama state, Maiduguri, Jiri, and Dambua in Bruno state, as well as Damaturu, Gujba, and Gaidam in Yobe state. We, the data collection method uh, utilized KII and FGDs, and for the KIIs, we interviewed 65 respondents across all the uh, location, and uh, we uh, for the FGDs, the FGDs were conducted in each of the locations with six to seven uh, respondents participating, and uh, they all covered uh, all the key, uh, the targeted audience, community actors, military personnel, representatives from governmental and non-governmental organizations, and other stakeholders. And uh, it is important for us to also note uh, here that special attention was also given to capture the voices of socially vulnerable groups such as women and people living with disabilities in order to obtain uh, views uh, from this category of persons. And uh, in terms of our contextualization of Nigerian military epidemic response, uh, in the wake of the devastation caused by Boko Haram in Nigeria, the military assumed a larger role in humanitarian response. Although the National Emergency Management Agency and the State Emergency Management Agency are responsible for coordinating epidemic response. The military has additional logistical and technical capabilities to help deliver immediate assistance to regions mostly at in need. And this is a responsibility that the military uh, was able to discharge uh, quite well, as we will see. Uh, in subsequent uh, slides. Experiences and lessons from the involvement of the military in pandemic response demonstrates that the Nigerian military is prepared for contingency operations and that the military might be able to assume a larger role in health-related emergency. As a, result, as a result, the Nigerian military prepares for humanitarian emergencies and contingencies in accordance with section 2172, subsection C, of the Constitution, which fundamentally incorporates a statutory mandate of assistance to civil authorities into humanitarian response and operations for the Nigerian military. The framework of the National Disaster Response Plan also identified the military as a central actor in national emergency response and coordinations. Now, we try to look at selected cases on Nigeria's military epidemic response. Uh, the first uh, is the, 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 the case in 2019. Uh, in response to the outbreak of polio, the polio virus in Nigeria, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tukur Buratai, launched what was called the Theater Command Buratai Initiative Task Force in 2019. Uh, the task force was a partnership between the Nigeria military and state level healthcare service providers in order to ensure that an estimated 60,484 children that were trapped in 2,622 inaccessible settlements in the Northeast region were reached. Nigeria military's response to COVID-19 uh, was one of such examples also, which, which through, the, through the Nigerian Air Force, which commenced the production and the lifting of Liquefied, liquefied oxygen to be distributed to the isolation centers established for the treatment of COVID-19 victims across. And because of the lifting capability of the, of the Nigerian Air Force, it was able to dispatch all the, uh, the, the, the liquefied oxygen that were produced uh, to the respective the isolation centers across the country. The Nigerian Air Force was also able to lift a team of health officials of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control from, from Congo Brazzaville, where they were stranded due to the closure of air and land borders as a result of the COVID-19. Uh, the Defense 
Industries Corporation of Nigeria, DECON. It is a parastatal under the Ministry of Defense with mandate for the production of defense equipment, also was able to produce ventilators as part of its strategic intervention in responding to the COVID-19 situation in the country. Now, in this next slide that discusses the results of this uh, research, we did what we call a selection of voices on the military's role in epidemic response. We were able to identify three broad voices. The first category of voices are the positive voices, those who, who, who spoke about the positive role of the military, as well as the second group that spoke about the negative role of the military. And the third category is that category that has mixed feelings about the role of the military. Now, in terms of the positive role, uh, some of the respondents argue that one, the military played the role of restoring peace in response to violent attacks in communities and other associated danger. Two, we don't we don't we we don't know much about the role of the military, but they have assisted in many ways, such as providing medical services, providing ambulances for those that are critically ill. The other said we are actually from the core a village from Borno State, the military assist, as, assisted us in providing security and help during in, with, with respect to transportation. And the last but not the least in that category is that the role of the military is to defend the territories of Nigerian state. We can also be called upon by the civilian to provide aid in situations of insecurity like we have been doing in some cases. In terms of the negative uh, uh, perception. Uh, the first year said the, commun the community's perception of military pandemic response is poor because they are sometimes seen to cause unrest in the community. The second said they, referring to the military now, are not friendly and their role in such sector is limited. The third uh, person said Military are looters are not healthy for the community at all. The last but not the least under this category uh, said actually in some locations there are constraints because some of, our military, some of our military boys, once there is issue of insurgency, they will use that as an advantage against the community, like the use of rape, forced pregnancies, amongst others. In terms of those mixed voices we captured, uh, some of the comments, feedback uh, arising from that interaction was one, generally the military's role in relation to pandemic response is not encouraging, but there are sometimes in, but they are sometimes involved in conveying victims of bomb blasts to hospitals. Two, the only role of the military in pandemic response is the conveyance of the injured to the hospital during an intense period of insurgency. They do not play another role as far as law is concerned. Wow. The other said one of the major, one of the basic challenges is the refusal or the community to, of the community to accept such intervention. This can result from many factors such as religion, culture, or the nature of relationship between the military and the people. For instance, many people may reject polio vaccine due largely to religion. There are some slight typographical errors uh, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the slide. So the last but not the least in that category said, so what I'm saying is that bad behavior of the military can make people reject medical aid of the military in pandemic situation or epidemic situation, so to speak. Uh, in terms of the, the discussion, the discussion also centered around opportunities for improved civil military relations. Uh, civil military interaction in Nigeria demonstrates a successful model as well as provides opportunities for improvement in countries such as Nigeria that are, low, that are, that are, that are still developing uh, in terms of their ability uh, to deal with this issue of epidemic. And the example of strategies to promote civil military collaboration include the military participation in public health campaigns, involvement of civilian leaders in military outreach, and partnership with local organizations such as the Nigerian 
Red Cross. And in that context, involvement of local health personnel through the, <clears throat> through the Nigerian Red Cross, who might have a better understanding of local norms and, and community acceptance, has the potential of enhancing civil military acceptance, acceptance and cooperation in order to better and deal with uh, epidemics uh, in, those, in, in, those, in those communities. Additional examples of organizations the Nigerian military could partner with include local community health centers. These are scattered and they are spread across uh, communities in the country. Representatives from corresponding local government areas. And lastly, uh, the businesses of community leaders uh, in the context of how they are also being streamed uh, in this kind of discussion. Uh, it is important to also note that the military's role might extend beyond the provision of security during epidemic response. In the context of COVID-19, the evolving role of the Nigerian military will be extended to the, was extended to the construction of field hospitals to reduce, to increase health healthcare capacities during such, such times. Now, in terms of the recommendations for this research, we made five key recommendations. Uh, the first is about deepening understanding of local context. And at this point is quite important uh, based on the fact that the credibility and effectiveness of the military is directly related to the quality of interaction with the civilian population, which can test, which can best be achieved through a more nuanced understanding of the local context. So where the military understands the local context, it is better able to relate more freely and get the buy-in of the civilian population. Expansion of military doctrine. This research also argued and advocated for the broadening of military doctrines from civilian protection against its enemies to include civilian protection against diseases, which calls for a transformation within the military to strengthen its skills and expertise against unconventional threats to human security, such as the outbreak of diseases and other health-related uh, challenges. Uh, the third recommendation is about building community trust in dealing with epidemics. Expanding the military community involvement during times of stability and in non-military areas might promote civil military cooperation during crisis situation. And there are many examples of such where the strategic relationship uh, that, 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 that is bolstered by trust uh, between, between the civilian communities or the civilian population and the military uh, is, 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 is able to help sustain, build and sustain uh, the cooperation that exists between the military and the civilian population. The fourth recommendation is about strategic partnerships in dealing with, epidemic, with epidemics. Research demonstrates the opportunity for a strategic partnership between civilian and military sectors in epidemic response. And by leveraging on such strategic partnerships, uh, the capacity of the Nigerian military would be bolstered and better positioned for more effective outcome. And we can see that coming quite clearly uh, in the context of how uh, the military is playing a leading role as one of the key uh, focal, focal, focal points uh, for both the discussion on pandemics, policy decisions on pandemic, as well as implementation of uh, strategies uh, relating to pandemic. And uh, the last point around recommendation is about the, is on the need to utilize military resources for more robust responses. And the one of such is in the administration of polio vaccines to geographically inaccessible mountainous areas in Nigeria. And uh, in this context, the military administered the polio vaccines in how to reach areas across Adama, Burma, Yobe State, 
Also, the airlifting capacity of the Air Force was utilized in the distribution of health-related equipment in response to COVID-19, particularly in how to reach communities across the country. Now, two key limitations uh, from this research uh, is the fact that, one, it is important to know that CAI and FGDs were conducted before the 2020 COVID-19 pandemics, uh, meaning that the interview, the respondents interviewed uh, did not refer to the military's involvement in COVID-19 response. And the last uh, limitation, or the second limitation, uh, is the fact that is the fact is, is is the fact that civil military relations might strongly differ in other regions of Nigeria, and therefore, generalization of the research to all of Nigeria should be should be there should be caution in doing that, given the regional differences in bo in both socioeconomic, demographic, cultural as well as the activities of civil society in those communities and locations in the country. Uh, in, in, in conclusion, uh, military involvement has become a cornerstone for modern epidemic response as we see across the world. While some view military participation as a critical element in bridging the gap in relations between the military and civilians, others are skeptical of such actions, citing experiences with the military that were characterized by gross violation of human Right. This research, uh, no doubt, highlights mixed perceptions of military involvement in epidemic response in Nigeria. While some view the participation of the military as a critical element in bridging the gap in civil military relations, uh, others are really skeptical of such actions. And they are skeptical because of their experiences uh, with the military that, we character, that is defined or characterized by broad violation of human rights. And this point is really important, uh, bearing in mind the, 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 the history of Nigeria, as well as uh, the history, as well as one which, in which uh, violation of human rights by the, by the military uh, became a defining feature of relationship between the state and citizens. And many of these communities or the civilian population uh, still carry uh, these experiences forward in terms of uh, the, the, the nasty interaction with the military and they still believe that the military is still that institution that is not positioned uh, to really deal with issues around responses to epidemics or even pandemics on a larger scale. Thank you very much. I stop here. I look forward to engaging with all of you uh, as part of the, the, the interactive session for this presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chris Kwaja. And uh, hopefully we can bring you up now um, live so that we can answer some questions. In the meantime, I encourage everyone, please, um, write your questions into the Q&A function, and we will get them to Dr. Kwaja to answer. All right. So our uh, first question comes to us from uh, Jenny McAvoy. Over the past one to two years, the Nigerian military has withdrawn its forces from several forward operating locations in the Northeast, where non-state armed groups now exercise greater control. If the Nigerian military attempts to support health services in currently inaccessible areas, could this lead to clashes with the non-state armed groups, thereby endangering the civilian population? Currently, the Nigerian government denies humanitarian access to non-state armed group controls areas on the grounds of counterterrorism, but wouldn't it be better for the civilian population for humanitarian actors to take on this role rather than the Nigerian military? Thank, 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 thank you very, thank you very much, um, Jenny, for that for that question. Um, the situation in Nigeria is a bit unique, um, unique in terms of capability, unique in terms of the availability of resources, 
uh, to deal with many of the issues that you captured. Uh, in the context of the current situation we, we face around how the Nigerian state, the military in Nigeria respond to many of the humanitarian uh, crises that we, we have. And I just give you one example. For instance, when you are dealing with issues that requires very rapid response in the context of uh, lifting capabilities, these are areas that non-state actors, humanitarian actors are limited in terms of their ability to, to, to deal with. Uh, in Nigeria, for instance, the UN has limited presence in terms of providing such assistance. Uh, the World Food Programme has, a, I know, one helicopter that it's using to provide food to many of those locations. And you are dealing with a very vast area that requires urgent support. And that is why you see a situation where the Nigerian military is forced to now take on additional responsibility of responding to many of those humanitarian needs because there are limitations in terms of the capacity of non-state, I mean, of humanitarian actors to really provide the much needed support. We, this is Nigeria. We are not talking about countries with 4 million as the entire population. Nigeria has 100 and me, over 190 million people. The region we are talking about alone has a population of about 30 million people. You are dealing with over 2 million people that are directly affected by insurgency. You are dealing with an area where the Nigerian military itself cannot even provide the much needed security that is required. Yes, there have been tensions between the military and non-state armed groups in the context of how the Nigerian military is able to effectively deploy and take over or reclaim many of the areas that the non-state armed groups have taken over. And that is why Borno State, since 2009, Borno as a state is still grappling with the activities of non-state armed groups, particularly Boko Haram, that are still battling or, or, involved in armed confrontation with the Nigerian uh, military. And that is why up till now, this whole question of dealing with the health-related requirements of communities within those areas are still areas, as, as, as still in the communities in those areas are still in their need of health-related and other social services that will keep them alive. The second question is from Derek about Nigeria has been plagued with corruption issues with the dash bribe and accepted necessary to overcome in country red tape. How do international NGOs operating in Nigeria deal with that? We've seen international NGOs coming with more robust and uh, a more robust approach in terms of their ability to ensure transparency and accountability when it comes to management of resources. And uh, I know many of the support that goes to the Nigerian military is always government to government support. And one of the biggest supporter, uh, provider of support to the Nigerian military today is the United States government. And I know that the United States government has been able to put in place its own mechanisms for ensuring accountability and transparency in the context of all the support that it provides uh, to the Nigerian to the Nigerian military. Where many of this corruption comes up is when it comes to resources maybe that are locally generated and distributed where the Nigerian government is fully in charge of such resources. You find leakages here and there and through those leakages, corruption become a major issue that affects or hampers the effectiveness of humanitarian response in the context of how issues around epidemic or even pandemic in the context of COVID-19 uh, are, are, are dealt with in the country. Uh, Victoria. Our uh, next question comes to you from Victoria Hart. Um, it's actually a question that I also had myself. Um, you mentioned a number of positive, negative, and mixed uh, responses to military involvement and pandemic response, but were there any trends that you saw in those responses? For instance, uh, were certain groups of people more likely to have positive or negative responses, such as men versus women, uh, community leaders versus community members, people of different ethnicities, anything that you can draw out of those uh, responses? 
Yeah, thank you. G gender, gender is one. Uh, gender in the context of the experiences of women and girls relating to rape. And uh, in, the, in, in the context of the involvement of the military in responding to epidemics, um, this whole feeling across gender that the military has a tainted image uh, that is defined around issues of rape and that because of that, it now we, it, 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 it affects the perception uh, of such community, of such category of persons when it comes to opening up or accepting the kind of support that the military is providing in the context of uh, in the context of pandemic response or epidemic response. The other point is about ethnicity, not ethnicity per se, but religion, culture, where it's not all the communities that are open to having or embracing or welcoming uh, people, maybe particularly the military. And uh, in the context of the administration of polio vaccine, for instance, and I'm sure maybe Adam, you're familiar with this story of Kano State, where the Nigerian government, uh, the, 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 the Muslim community had refused to allow polio vaccine on the children uh, because one, even the procedure for even administering them, many of the women were on puda. Puda means men are not allowed to just have access to the women in terms of contact. So, and the women are the ones in custody of the children. So how do you administer polio vaccines in the context of a situation where societies are not closed, are not too open to allow for those contacts? So that can, that's a kind of example we also find in, 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 in the context of a polio vaccine in those hard to reach locations. And many ways through which that, uh, uh, such situations have been, have been dealt with, it's about constant, advocacy, sensitization of the communities to make them appreciate why this health-related support that the military is providing is actually for the benefit of the communities and they need it to survive. And that the military beyond just holding guns to protect them physically has assumed this new responsibility of winning the hearts and minds of the people. But definitely, these are all areas, these are all issues, this categorization of gender, age, geography, and ethnicity, they are very key issues that, have, that can shape the extent to which humanitarian response in the context of uh, the provision of services related to epidemics or pandemics become very important. And in terms of geography, there are, the Nigeria is divided into two, north and south. You have the Christian north, I mean the Christian south and the Muslim north. And because of that division on, on, on the basis of geography, you still have many of those challenges in terms of the experiences of even bringing, for instance, military personnel from the, from the South who might not be able to speak Hausa or Kanuri in the context of the Northeast or Fulfude, which are the local dialects in those areas. Now that huge barrier around communication constitutes a major, a major challenge to the kind of constructive engagement or partnership that such communities will have with the military. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Samuel Boland. Can you speak further about the relationship between the military and the Ministry of Health in Nigeria and how you think an expanded military role might be taken by the Ministry of Health and what you think the opportunities and challenges for how that relationship might change if the military's role in disease outbreak preparedness and response is expanded. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Sam. Uh, be, be, before, now, the, in, in, uh, before now, the whole idea of the military getting involved in health-related support is new because the simple assumption is that the military is trained to protect the, the territorial integrity of the country. And by doing that, the military is just an institution that in the context of its own command and control and rules or doctrine is supposed to be out there far off from the people. But because of some of the limitations arising from the extent to which effective humanitarian support or support or assistance can be provided to communities in need, and the military is better positioned to be deployed rapidly and more effectively 
due to the limitations of the Ministry of Health, for instance, that might not have the kind of protection, capacity for protection on the way in terms of accessing communities, all those deficits that we see inherent in the Ministry of Health become the strength, are actually the strength of the Nigerian military. I gave an example, for instance, of the airlifting capacity of the Nigerian Air Force. Uh, when the lockdown was, uh, was, was implemented in the country, the planes flights were grounded, but the, the Nigerian Air Force had the capability and the, 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 the I mean, had the cap capability to distribute ventilators and other, uh, other, other, other facilities that are required to deal with the with COVID-19. And through that spot, uh, many people now realized, uh, and then the Ministry of Health itself realized and appreciated the kind of support that the Nigerian Air Force is providing. And this is new thinking, new thinking in the sense that going forward, the military institution itself, the Ministry of Health it, itself, is be, they are beginning to see the opportunity that there are opportunities for more relationship, more partnership between them in order to deliver on services that might require the support of the military because of the existing capacities that it has. And I think for me, that on its own is a major breakthrough in terms of civil military relations in the context of how joint planning and joint deployment can really help the can really help them in addressing many of the humanitarian challenges that people are facing. Thank you. Well unfortunately we're out of time for the presentation uh, QA, but there are some really great remaining questions. And so we will make sure that we route those questions to you, Chris, so that you can respond uh, directly to the uh, participants who've asked them and continue this conversation. Uh, so at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dave Pilati uh, to give uh, the introduction for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. All right, our fourth and final presentation on our Carnegie funded research is going to be from Dr. Nason Adlaparver from Yale University. He will be presenting on humanitarian civil military information sharing and in complex emergencies realities, strategies, and risks. Nason is a lecturer at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Um, he's held several positions there. He was also a postdoctoral fellow with both the Council on Middle East Studies and the Anthropology Department. And in 2017, he was awarded the Rice Faculty Fellowship by Yale's Macmillan Center. Uh, concurrently, he was also a visiting academic at Oxford University's Middle East Center that was in the fall of 2018. Nason teaches courses, I've seen him live in action. They're really dynamic. He focuses on disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation in Afghanistan, the socio-political impacts of US-led interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, and on society and politics in the Middle East. He holds a PhD from the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex University. And I think what's also amazing about him is he built, has built his academic credentials on top of policy and program work that he's done with the UN and with NGOs in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Jordan. And his research focuses on humanitarianism, migration, socio-political relations, and transitional and conflict and affected contexts. Nason, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, really appreciate that introduction. Um, and let me just take uh, an opportunity to thank uh, you and the rest of your colleagues at the Naval War College and of course at uh, Watson Institute, uh, Seth and Adam, uh, for the opportunity to participate in this research. It's very exciting. Uh, and I'll just take a moment also to thank the advisory group that was so critical at various stages of this research process in you know, bringing it to, to fulfillment. Um, what I'm going to do today is, and as the, the, the title indicates, Let's talk about one of the two research streams that uh, research and my report looked at. And this is a research stream that I think is, is more urgent and I think is more relevant, which is looking at uh, information sharing in the context of deconfliction and specifically the humanitarian notification system for deconfliction, particularly in Syria and Yemen, 
Uh, and I'll talk a little further about that uh, system or mechanism uh, in a moment. The other strand looked at the uh, complexity of information sharing uh, mechanisms, collective mechanisms and bilateral mechanisms for information sharing. And it kind of looked at the assumptions and realities uh, that take place uh, in those uh, interactions and kind of sets of relations. Uh, sorry that I can't talk about that today, but I thought I'd focus on one and, and do a bit of a deeper dive. Uh, I should probably also say that this is really exploratory. That at the time of doing the research, this was the only piece of research or scholarly research that's been done looking at uh, humanitarian notification systems. I've since uh, found out uh, that uh, Sarah Miller's also done a, a master's thesis on the topic, uh, but really there's very little to, to draw from, uh, and I'm very keen therefore to get your feedback, kind of comments and, and critiques. Okay. So when we, when we started this research, um, this question was posed to me, and it essentially asks, you know, what are the risks posed to civilians by deconfliction and information sharing in civil coordination during humanitarian activities? Now, that's a very broad uh, kind of place to start. Um, and an initial reading of this question might focus on technical failures and operational errors, uh, such as data leakages, uh, poorly designed information platforms or failure to use uh, protocols correctly. But an initial kind of reading of the, uh, of the literature and policy guidance that was available um, kind of pointed to the fact that the debate so far was largely technical and very normative in nature. Uh, also, members of the advisory board were really pushing for a more critical reading of the question. So what we ended up um, focusing on or adopting was a much more kind of political and pragmatic lens for analysis and really problematizing the notion of uh, or assumptions underpinning civil information, particularly HNS 4D itself, and by virtue of that, looking at kind of broader risks. We kind of unpacked the, that broader research question into four areas, which structured the research. The first looking at literature, the second really looking at um, kind of the dynamics of uh, a complexity surrounding information sharing, which I, I talked about previously, that first research stream. But the, the third research question really focused on what I'm talking about today. That's opportunities and constraints in signal information sharing with a particular focus on HNS 4D. And the last really was about um, recommendations moving forward and further research. Now, Rob did quite a, a good job initially at, at kind of covering some of the CIVMIL coordination literature. Um, I'm gonna be brief here, but just kind of point out uh, what, what I came across or what we came across uh, in terms of um, the literature itself. Now, there is a sizable body of literature, as I said, that looks at kind of technical uh, and information management perspectives on, on signal information sharing. Uh, little on its politics and the kind of mechanics of uh, and political dynamics, let's say. Um, for example, there, is, there are debates looking at the challenges linked to military actors in being able to declassify information to share with humanitarian actors and the kind of temporal impacts that that has. It's also noteworthy that given the kind of growth of an application of technology in the sector, that there's a, a recent development over the past three to four years of um, data protection guidelines by leading humanitarian and academic organizations. And I'm thinking here of uh, Harvard humanitarian, humanitarian Initiatives Signal Code, uh, OSHA's uh, Data Responsibility Guidelines. And now while these are incredibly important documents, and I'm, I'm not trying to detract from that importance, they are largely normative, kind of principle-driven or technical in nature. And I would argue that this doesn't sufficiently encompass the local level political and operation realities that should be contributing and potentially driving our understanding and kind of recommendations surrounding information sharing. There is also um, a body of literature, it's not large, but which kind of looks at the value of academic civil centers for developing networks and cultivating knowledge and information sharing outside of complex emergency settings and in advance of. And that's my plug for the, the War College and for, uh, for the Watson Institute. And there is analysis promoting the, liaison, the use of liaison personnel, such as OCHA's SIM cord officers, uh, 
uh, which are one of the key mechanisms that bridge this civil military gap um, in uh, um, complex emergency settings. And they largely overcome uh, the linguistic, cultural and bureaucratic challenges. Um, I think there's more research to be done there looking at their role, but I, I thought I'd present that to you. Now, there's a, there's a clear gap in the literature here, as I've mentioned a few times now, on the kind of political elements and the more uh, grassroots motivations and assumptions about the way that information uh, sharing functions. And there's very, very limited scholarly analysis of HNS 4D, which is what this research was in part trying to respond to. So how do we go about the research? Um, as mentioned, we established an advisory board, which was both uh, were well, composed of both academics um, and kind of policy and, uh, uh, practitioners. Um, their names are up there. And again, thanks to them for their, their excellent guidance um, throughout the process. The research was large, well, entirely qualitative in nature, and it was based on a literature review, which I've alluded to, and the use of uh, semi-structured interview methods. Uh, hybrid sampling technique, both purposive and snowballing as we progress through the uh, interview process, um, to a total of 30 interviews with 27 research participants. Uh, that was, the data collection was conducted from April 2019 to February 2020. Uh, who was interviewed? Uh, members of um, USG, both civilian and military, uh, members of CIVMIL and NGO coordinating entities, uh, personnel from UN agencies, um, NGOs and academics. Where were these individuals? Well, they were sitting in Afghanistan, Haiti, Iraq, Nigeria, Syria, the United States and Yemen. Um, and how were they conducted? Well, mostly through the use of an interview guide, but through Skype and, and telephone calls. And there was a few in-person meetings. And of course, this was, this was pre-COVID, so it was, it was possible to do so. In terms of ethical considerations, there was IRB approval, um, an exemption both through Brown and Yale. Um, and we utilized informed consent and anonymity, which was a really, um, important element given the nature of this research. So before I dive into some of the findings and kind of my analysis on HNS 4D, what is the mechanism? I'm sure some of you are very familiar and perhaps some of you aren't, so I'm just gonna quickly go through kind of an overview of the way it functions. Um, the mechanism involves some humanitarians, not all, voluntarily sharing GPS coordinates of their infrastructure and kind of dynamic movements. And that's passed to warring parties, especially those using air power, with the logic being that it helps protect against um, mistargeted airstrikes. Again, some humanitarian actors will regularly provide lists of coordinates um, to OCHA, who then collates that information and then passes it normally through email to the major parties in the conflict, or at least those who've agreed to participate in the system. In Syria, that includes the RCR, Russian Ministry of Defense, uh, Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and coalition forces. Uh, the mechanism was established in 2014 and by 2018 had 778 notifications. In Yemen, on the other hand, there's EHOC, the Saudi Ministry of Defense, which in terms will notify other members of the Saudi-led coalition. That mechanism was established in 2015, and by 2018 had 64,000 notifications. It's a vast, vast number, and I'll talk about that in a moment. In theory, these coordinates are then added to a no-strike list, which is maintained by each kind of military actor. And once that receipt of data is acknowledged, email goes back saying, we've received this data, uh, theoretically, the site is then deconflicted in the sense that it's no longer a target uh, or shouldn't be included in any sort of targeting operations that those um, warring parties or parties to the conflict uh, carry out. Now, it's important to remember that this process is only to notify parties of the conflict. Um, it's not a request or for approval for those operations, and that becomes important later on, as I'll highlight. But of course, there's a major problem with the mechanism, 
And while the mechanism has been mobilized to increase uh, the security of humanitarians in, in Syria and Yemen, um, and other forms of uh, other mechanisms used in other contexts, Afghanistan, Iraq, and others, um, these parties continue, or humanitarian actors continue to be struck. They were being struck before, and they're being struck after. Um, and there are indications that there's a systematic targeting of humanitarians. Um, and obviously, many humanitarians are very, very wary, therefore, of sharing information through the mechanism itself. So for me, going into this research, the question was much more about, well, not so much whether military forces are striking humanitarian targets, as concerning as this is, but more, were they struck as a result of being identified through the mechanism? Now, we thought we had an answer to this during this um, kind of research process. In August 2019, the UN Secretary General launched a very high level board of inquiry looking at seven sites in Syria that were on the no strike list, but yet were still struck after being uh, notified um, or deconflicted. Uh, in April 2020, they came out with their results and they found that it was probable or highly probable that five of these sites were struck by the Syrian government or their allies, i.e. the Russian Federation. Um, one site was um, deemed to be struck by a, um, a kind of a local armed group, and another was deemed to be outside of the remit of the, the assessment or the inquiry uh, once it uh, was initiated. Now, apart from you know, making this connection and saying, yes, it's quite likely that these strikes were, sites were struck by you know, government forces here and the Russian Federation, the report was rather insipid. You know, it recommended providing kind of clearer guidance to participants on IHL and the mechanism, you know, strengthening some of the procedures uh, and improving record keeping. So I, I, don't felt it, I don't feel that it really responded to kind of some of those crucial questions. It, it didn't imply that anything was wrong with the mechanism. I believe it mischaracterized the scope of the problem. Um, and as I mentioned, didn't really answer or even ask fundamental questions. Some of those being, does inclusion on a no strike list make humanitarians more or less safe? A really critical question. You know, is it more than just tightening up inf information sharing protocols at OCHA? And really, should we continue using the mechanism? So let me just take that first question, quite a critical one. Now, one of the things that really came through systematically um, through, throughout the research was um, this idea of a notification black box. So this does, does lend some support to why it was hard for the UN to uh, reach a conclusion. But as this quote articulates, one of the main concerns with notification is the problem of the so-called black box. It's very difficult to assess if notification is working or not. In order to assess if humanitarian notification is effective, we need to know what is done with the information once it's received by parties to the conflict. How do they process it and factor it into their military operations? Only then can we know if humanitarian notification works. This black box is essentially, once that information is shared, it disappears into internal military mechanisms, which obviously for uh, confidentiality reasons or security reasons isn't shared. But there was also a secondary concern which kind of circulated around this idea of the black box or extended it. And I'll read the quote again. In Yemen, HNS 4D now incorporates operating procedures for collecting movements over land, sea, and air, temporary deconfliction of actual warehouses, other venues, and a permanent deconfliction list. So very broad. You can download all, download all of these forms and it's all paper-based. And what that leads to, to paraphrase what comes next, is that with 64,000 notification sites, there's a real question about whether that information from you know, paper documents can be collated and then actually processed um, by, in this case, members of the Saudi coalition in Yemen. And that's a very large question mark. Now, a number of the, the, the interviewees talked about and of concerns that this generated, clearly a, a lack of information or information scarcity, which impacted their kind of calculations about participation. But yet some humanitarians and mostly those involved in kind of signal coordination itself argued that it wasn't a complicating factor. They essentially argued that the uh, belligerents to the conflict that were receiving this information didn't need the notification um, list, the no strike list to 
target um, these humanitarian facilities if they chose to, that they had their own information collecting and intelligence collection mechanisms. So in a sense, it wasn't really a question about whether um, notification information was used for targeting. Now, this may be the case, it may be a defense, um, but just like the black box, this is, this is in a sense unknowable. And I think it further complicates decision-making you know, on, on participation in the mechanism itself. So I'm kind of trying to paint this um, confusion around the, the, the purpose of the mechanism, confusion around the effectiveness of the mechanism, and the kind of information scarcity that humanitarians have in making choices around participation. And I should add, not all do. So why participate then? Um, there are four key reasons that came through. The first essentially being that there's a need for internal accountability. You know, people on the ground need to be able to say to their headquarters, if something were to go wrong, we use the mechanism, we did what was requested of us. And that to some extent relates to the second point or the second rationale, which is around um, donor pressure to participate. Now this was mentioned as a, um, especially the case for US donors who promoted the mechanism, either without being aware of some of these complicating factors and shortcomings or by them being dismissed. Um, and you'll note, I don't have a quote for that point because people were slightly uncomfortable in, in being put on the record. A third um, issue, and I'll read out the quote here is, I, can't, I can understand why so many of our partners feel uncomfortable in sharing notification information. They look around at the overarching trends towards humanitarian operations being impacted and say, why bother, what's the point? But there remains a sense that despite the odds, you still have to try. And even if we're skeptical about its value, it's the only tool we have. So in a certain sense, that's people feeling they have to do something and it's a kind of just in case clause as well, I feel. And a fourth reason, um, kind of further complicates the, um, the issue uh, about purpose is that a lot of humanitarians, particularly in the last six to 12 months have been talking about the value of humanitarian notification as an accountability mechanism. So they say, if we accept that the operational value of notification, notification is maybe quite limited, we at least hope for some level of accountability. So when a facility is struck, they can demonstrate that it was deconflicted legally and that all parties to the conflict were informed and therefore could be held to account. Uh, two main standpoints on that. Uh, the first obviously being that it's very essential to document um, the transgressions so that uh, in the short term, at least it can be said as a transgression here, we deconflicted, something needs to be done. And then there are more longer term uh, aspects of accountability in terms of collecting information for a tribunal or an ICC um, uh, legal case, for example. But I thought this uh, second quote is very informative, and that's that there are varying expectations among members of the humanitarian community on the mechanism and accountability. There are some partners who unfortunately wrongly expect that if a hospital or school is struck, that immediately there will be an international tribune conven tribunal convened, sorry, or a security council type meeting. An investigation is launched and there will be consequences. And clearly that hasn't been happening and won't happen. So there's a question of what, if at all, can notification provide in terms of accountability? The personal view of uh, this individual who's involved in signal coordination is that it's distinctly unclear because even where facilities have been deconflicted and then struck, responsibility and the events leading up to the incident have been uh, contested by all parties involved. There's a second element of kind of, um, or, or key findings I think that came through in the discussion and uh, in the interviews. And that, you know, while we have this information scarce operating environment, the range of motiva motivations for and humanitarian perspectives on participation and purpose and effectiveness. There's also a lot of political dynamics that play out in the operation of the mechanism. And there's two quotes here, which um, they're relatively long, so I'll not go through them both. But essentially what we're seeing is kind of pushback, and both of these talk to the Yemen context, a pushback from the Saudi-led coalition, 
um, in terms of essentially saying we don't accept your notification um, and then the UN or the humanitarian party who has submitted the notification thinks, well, what do we do about this? Do we still go ahead? We might be struck. Um, and in the case of uh, the UN here, and this is OSHA in particular, the United Nations Department of Safety and Security in many cases will just limit that movement and say, you know, you, you can't head out because we don't necessarily know what may happen. The risks are going up theoretically. Um, and in a sense, what these quotes are kind of implying is that the way that um, notifications are being rejected or questioned as a way of kind of um, regulating movements and humanitarian action, in this case, in Yemen. The second quote there refers to the Saudi-led coalition being able to wave the flag and say, you know, we're funding and approving lots of humanitarian work in Yemen, but yet, What's also happening in a very heavy-handed way is them using to prevent movements or to send, message to send messages to humanitarian actors. But it's not all one-sided. Um, there's a quote here about ICRC and MSF's um, mode of information sharing. I just want to point out that uh, neither of these organizations, given their very particular standing in the, in the humanitarian um, sector, they don't participate directly in the mechanism, but in parallel notify uh, military actors bilaterally of their locations and movements. So they do have a slightly uh, more uh, powerful standpoint, let's say, in the system to be able to do some of the things that I'm now going to highlight. Essentially, um, MSF would send an updated list of coordinates um, on a regular basis, always making sure that they were clear about the entire list that was shared, um, therefore kind of controlling and making sure that there's nothing missed or any kind of gaps in the in the no strike list so that's one way of kind of maintaining kind of the quality of information shared uh, and also kind of questions around the the way that these locations were identified they wouldn't give a single gps coordinates they would kind of push out a polygon um, which would create almost a buffer and therefore hopefully further protect those sites from any accidental uh, targeting and as it mentions there, because their size and their mandate and the volume of work they were doing, they could try to leverage a little bit the information that was shared with uh, the Saudi-led coalition. So what I'm really trying to point out there, I guess, in well, throughout all of these kind of quotes, is that there is a significant power differential that exists between uh, the military uh, actors in these two contexts in one position, building a very strong uh, standpoint, both in terms of the nature of the black box and the sharing of information, but also kind of in the power dynamics of the sharing information with uh, typically um, less well-placed humanitarian actors. And I think this quote really nicely sums it up. HNS 40 is a system you can opt into or out of that may or may not work. It has no accountability, but if you don't opt in, you have less leverage and have taken some type of risk, yet you don't know the particulars. Basically, militaries will do what they want, and you're at their mercy as an NGO. So just before I um, move to wrap up, I think it's probably important just to lay out the uh, UN OCHA's standpoint on these two elements of purpose and, purpose and effectiveness. Now that first quote there, you know, highlights a few things. I think in one, it's kind of a rolling back clarification and simplification, simplification of the kind of purpose of the mechanism. Um, note the, the point about um, IHL uh, and the issue that essentially the mechanism provides no additional protections and therefore no real conduits to accountability. And this is uh, OCHA articulating this in particular. So they're definitely isolating or moving away from, from that kind of standpoint. They also have a standpoint on the kind of effectiveness and future steps to uh, address some of the shortcomings that I've raised here. And largely they're saying it's an iterative process that builds trust with, uh, with military actors over time. I think that is true in many contexts, but whether that's the case in the highly politicized context of Syria and Yemen, I think is a different question. And what they're hoping to do is leverage that relationship over time to explore that black box and be able to kind of assess where things have gone wrong, why they've gone wrong, and essentially be able to um, evaluate how robust 
the notification system is. I think that's very well intentioned, but I think there will be challenges. Not that this is a, it's entirely impossible, there will be challenges to do that moving forward. So with an eye on time, um, what kind of conclusions do I have? Well, there's not only a lack of clarity on the purpose around security and accountability of the mechanism, but also this really fundamental challenge of not being able to assess effectiveness because of the black box. And this, of course, compounds confusion over purpose and participation. Many humanitarians, but not all, participate on the assumption that it's probably better to be involved just in case it makes them safer. And it, it may well do, but just in case it makes them safer, just in case it leads to accountability and to comply with donor and headquarter demands. The mechanism functions to differing degrees in different contexts amidst this kind of stark power differential uh, between military actors and humanitarian actors in deeply politicized environments in Yemen and Syria, which admittedly does complicate the use of the mechanism. But I still do believe that there are inherent constraints within the mechanism that weren't adequately addressed in the kind of board of inquiry that I think we need to think about. So what did I conclude in some of the, the, the final kind of paragraphs in the research? Well, that at the current time, acknowledging that humanitarian notification may be saving lives, but knowing that we cannot prove it, what we can conclude about the mechanism is that it serves to provide humanitarians with an opportunity to conform to acceptable norms of information sharing and safety, whilst providing military actors the guise of due diligence. It may also serve as a very costly exercise to maintain the appearance of humanitarian safety um, and create opportunities for military actors to monitor and regulate humanitarian action. And Last slide on, almost, almost at 30 minutes, the last slide on policy and research implications. Now, as I said, this is still um, exploratory, um, but one thing I think is very clear is the donors, including USG that are, and the humanitarian head offices that are promoting and requiring compliance with the mechanism would be wise to think more carefully about the limitations that have been raised here. Um, and why this may be the only mechanisms currently available um, I think they need to kind of consider some of those shortcomings and the way that they promote it. I also think it would be very um, advisable, and I guess this is a, a note to um, our colleagues at uh, Naval War College and, and, and Watson Institute, that it would be advisable to kind of promote a broad-based debate and a building on what's been done here, including with local humanitarian actors, which I didn't have the chance to speak to kind of regarding their perspectives on the purpose and added value or lack thereof in participating and to kind of look at any security and accountability outcomes that we can or the lack of those outcomes. And essentially I, the goal will be to communicate this, this amongst humanitarians to collectively mobilize people uh, so that there's more of a kind of collective standpoint which can inform decision making around participation or modes of information sharing in, in, in the mechanism. I think it's also important that UNOCHA and they've been doing the best they can in terms of the challenges that they're facing, but I think they should be more transparent and communicative what they think the mechanism can and cannot do. And we saw some quotes from them there, but I think it's fair to say that most of the research participants I spoke to, they didn't grasp this interpretation that, that OCHA had. Um, I think this also raises questions about whether the need for another actor beyond simply um, UN OCHA, who is deeply enmeshed in the kind of politics of delivery to look at the um, kind of assess the efficacy of the mechanism, but also provide oversight. I'm not saying they shouldn't be operating the mechanism. I mean, that's an open debate, but I think in terms of oversight and looking at some of the questions that have been raised, perhaps they're not best placed to do so, although they would contribute to such an initiative, I think. Uh, finally, in terms of research, as I've laid out, the analysis is extremely limited and you know, I've covered a few, a few bases here in terms of the research, but there's clearly a lot more that needs to be done. And I think a starting point would be to look at particular complex emergencies and to look at kind of the contextual factors, including the evolution of the conflict, uh, signal coordination, information sharing practices, um, to really understand the emergence of HNS4D, because as you see in the scales quite different between Yemen and Syria, 
and there are different um, mechanisms being used in other contexts, uh, Nigeria, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, some of the others. And I think this, was, this would give us a contingent understanding, which is much more kind of rooted in time and place to help better evaluate the efficacy of the mechanism and potentially inform its management and delivery moving forward. I shall stop there. I apologize for running over a little. Um, and I'm yeah, really open and excited about questions and comments. Outstanding, Nason. Thank you so much. Uh, we got just over 10 minutes, so I will get right to it. Jenny McAvoy has a, a really wonderful question. What are your recommendations to ensure that humanitarian notifications to the parties are adequately factored into both planned or deliberate and dynamic airstrikes, as well as other military operations? That's the first part. And then she also has a question on how better transparency can be achieved. Okay. I think, you know, as I've highlighted with the, the first part of the question there, you know, there's a challenge in understanding what's taking place currently. And that's one of the things I wanted to communicate. Rather than just there's different perspectives, there's also a, um, this black box phenomenon that's driving a lot of this misunderstanding, I think. Um, so to look at ways of, you know, kind of integrating them into kind of uh, planned and dynamic movements, I think, I mean, that's, that's genuinely difficult uh, to, to explore. But I think one thing that would be necessary there would be to potentially think about, and I guess this goes back to Ocha's point, thinking about closer coordination with military actors. Is this even possible though, I think is, is a big question. And will we be, will be given access to some of those um, protocols or processes in the way it's being used? I think there'd be a value in perhaps looking at, and this is off the top of my head slightly, I think there'd be a value in thinking about and promoting other mechanisms or other places to make public some of those uh, movements and locations um, that may also contribute to accountability. And I think, you know, the question there is accountability for what? It's a short-term piece, a long-term piece. My impressions are that organizations should still be documenting, obviously still documenting what's taking place on the ground in terms of transgressions, such as the hospital in the picture here that we're looking at, that was struck in Syria. But I think, um, the likelihood of long-term accountability is extremely limited. I know that I've only partially answered your question, but again, I think that's just because of a lack of understanding of what happens inside those military elements. That may actually, I should add, be slightly different in contexts such as Afghanistan, where you're actually working with the US government. There may be scope there for broader discussion about the way some of that information is utilized, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, but that wasn't particularly the focus of, of what I was looking at here. Great, and I'll apologize in advance for pronouncing the name, but uh, Lakimi has a, a question just to what you were saying, uh, very context-driven, this issue. So this is specific to Syria for the cross-border operations and what liabilities humanitarian partners, organizations may have or raise from information sharing, specifically involving implementing partners um, and they're speaking about the operationalized model for Northwest Syria. I think one of the things that came through very strongly um, when it comes particularly to kind of cross-border work in Syria was that as many people working in the context know that any information that is communicated and any information that is um, articulated in Damascus or elsewhere um, is largely assumed not to be um, safe and not to have been accessed by either the Syrian government or some of their allies. So one of the major challenges there is about uh, the methods for sharing that information, um, the increased likelihood of uh, data leakage, which is assumed. And I think when it comes into to targeting, I mean, we've got a very particular political uh, scenario there that I think, I mean, it begs the question of, where information is driven from and protections in place. So I think this is getting slightly away from the, the particular mechanism more into kind of the broader question of information sharing, but where information comes from, how it's protected. And I think there's a lot of concern, as I'm sure you're aware of, otherwise you wouldn't have asked the question about um, those partners on the ground being targeted. And I think also in terms of what international actors, UN agencies and humanitarians that are kind of, let's say international NGOs, can do about protecting those partners that are on the ground. 
We've got a question from, uh, from Len Rubenstein. He's, first, he said, thanks for the great presentation. What do you make of the argument that donor pressure, the US in particular, in Syria and Yemen uh, was motivated politically to make it appear as that they were doing something to stop the violence against humanitarians, despite history of a lack of good faith and adherence to commitments by Syria and the Saudis? I think two things strike me, and this is based on what I was told. Um, the first is that I would, I would agree that I think there's a, a political a motivation for the appearance to be doing something uh, given the particular posture that the US has in Syria uh, and going back to um, the nature of how they've chosen or chosen not to intervene. I think there's, I think also there's, actually Dave, can you just um, repeat the second part of the question there? Sure thing. It's, uh, it's essentially getting to the political, was there political motivations? Did you, did you see anything that it, it was oh, yeah. essentially us, the US, making it look like we were doing something to stop the violence? Um, even though Len is arguing there's a history of lack of good faith in adhering to those commitments yeah. to, to IHL by Syria and the Saudis. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd agree with what, what Len's saying. And I think, but I think there's a second element to this as well. And, you know, I was talking to some individuals, both uh, US uh, military, but also uh, USAID in, in a kind of uh, state. And I think there, in some senses, where that, I believe, is clearly a driving factor, they didn't articulate it that way. You know, they were talking more about just getting people on site to get this mechanism working, essentially. And either they weren't aware, I think, of the dynamics taking place on the ground, uh, at least in some cases it was presented that way. And I think in other cases, um, in one case in particular, two cases actually in particular, I was thinking about, it was almost kind of dismissed as well as in, you know, these are just the usual uh, civil coordination, humanitarians being perhaps overly concerned about, um, you know, getting involved in this. And they were just kind of pushing to, to get the mechanism functioning better with the assumption that in doing so it, it would help. Uh, it operates more effectively, which, as we've demonstrated, I don't think is, is the case. We're going to go to Zain Tayeb. Uh, good evening, Zain. She's worked with OCHA on the deconfliction in southern Syria, and she has a comment that it was, some, it was pretty complicated to get all the correspondence and communications between both the resident and humanitarian coordinator in both countries. Uh, who do you think is in best position to get involved in this process to make it easier, more effective, I should say, and efficient. Yeah, thanks Zane for that question. I think it is worth recognizing uh, the complexity. I talked about on the military side, um, the complexity of the amount of information in the Yemen context at least, and I think it's worth acknowledging the, the complexity and the challenges and just managing all of this information, both from, from humanitarians to OCHA uh, and to military counterparts. Oh, you've raised a very good question. Um, I mean, obviously there are political considerations to think about and, and who might do this. I mean, I think there's a role, um, and I hope this is not a cop out, but I think there's a role here for uh, academic entities, uh, you know, applied academic entities like the Naval War College and their, and their a partnership um, collaboration with Brown to at least ask these sorts of questions, um, which would probably inform some of that um, or inform oversight or some of the more critical questions that might need to be asked. I think in terms of who would be best placed therefore, in certain senses, I think the UN, and obviously there's political sensitivities around the Board of Inquiry, the UN is doing what they can, but I think we'd have to go outside, perhaps a broad-based um, institution, a new institution which brings together um, UN actors, um, but also humanitarians for a slightly more level playing field, um, and maybe some kind of advisory positions for, um, you know, academic or, or, or analysts might be a space which, in which discussion could take place. I think it would be very hard to then um, leverage what comes out of that, but at least there'd be more discussion, uh, transparent discussion about what's happening with the mechanism, what might happen with the mechanism, what steps may need to be taken. And that kind of goes back to my policy implication around gathering people to, together to be more transparent and to have more of these discussions so people can at least mobilize together and think collectively about what should be done because that really isn't happening. Except, you know, I know that in, internal to OCHA there's been these conversations, 
And I know that uh, INSO and other actors are trying to convene some of these discussions as much as they can, but it's more just responsive to requests coming in. So I think something more stru structured and um, less responsive would be, would be a good way of approaching it. I hope I answered your question. We're gonna, you got less, you got a minute or less, but this okay. is an important one. So this is, I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase Steve. So what about accountability? What, what, is this system gonna be able to be used for accountability purposes? Or is there just too much baggage there? I think OCHA is clearly um, moving away from questions around accountability. And we saw that, um, we saw that in, in terms of some of the, the quotes that I put up. And they're just trying to say quite fairly that this is just about putting an X on a rooftop to try and help um, military planning. I think there is value, as I said earlier, in the, the documentation information, and I would still encourage that taking place because we don't quite know how this will play out. But I think the idea that there's going to be um, lots of comeuppance in the kind of short term or even in the medium, medium term is very unlikely, given the power differential that we're seeing, given the hesitation of certain actors, the UN and other, um, let's say, um, well, militaries and governments that are involved to actually um, follow up on. IHL transgressions, which are happening on a frequent basis. So I would say keep doing the documenting, but don't have um, excessively high hopes on what may come of it. But you never do know. Excellent. Th Nason, thanks so much. We will get those additional questions to him. Please. And I'm going to hand it over to Adam for the UN OCHA reassessment discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So now we move into the final portion of our program for today reassessing the Civil Military Coordination Service at UNOCHA, findings and recommendations. And this really brings us full circle, I think, to my initial comments this morning when I introduced this program, in that one of our goals here is not just to produce research for research's sake, but also to start moving the policy discussion forward and to start having an impact on the organization and the structure of civilian military coordination globally. And this is an example of a situation where UNOCHA actually came to us, the Center for Human Rights and Humanitarian Studies, and asked for this assessment or reassessment of the Civil Military Coordination Service. I'm very pleased uh, to turn, over, turn it over momentarily uh, to two of our uh, researchers who have worked on this, uh, Rob Grace and Brittany Card. As mentioned previously, Rob Grace is a researcher and affiliated fellow at CHRHS, where he undertakes research on humanitarian military relations. Brittany Card is a deputy director of the Providence Emergency Management Agency and a visiting fellow this year at CHRHS, and we're very lucky to have her. She's also a consultant for various organizations on humanitarian affairs and humanitarian civil military coordination, including the Humanitarian Advisory Group and the Center for Civilians in Conflict. Prior to joining FEMA, Brittany was an assistant professor in the Humanitarian Response Program at the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, so thank you both, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Adam, for the intro. Hello again to everybody. Great to be uh, uh, talking to you all again. Um, uh, my apologies that Brittany and I are now standing in the way of all of you getting back to your days and your lives, but we're very honored to have the chance to present uh, some findings from this study that we've been working on this year on CMCS. Um, just a couple words to um, uh, contextualize what this report is. Um, uh, the context for it is the decision by OCHA in 2018 to disband CMCS as a standalone unit, and the decision in the following year in 2019 to reverse that decision and then to reconstitute uh, CMCS. Um, the initial decision to disband CMCS um, was um, not undertaken as a result of consultation with CMCS's various partners. Um, so after the reconstitution in, in 2019, um, there was a uh, view of the importance of engaging with partners to make sure that moving forward, uh, CMCS is situated in a way where it can uh, respond to partners' need and, and needs and be um, informed about what partners' views are 
of what they want to see from CMCS. Um, so these findings we present are uh, today are drawing very much from our extensive engagements with CMCS and CMCS's partner uh, organizations. Uh, so we engaged with a, a wide array of uh, partners in this process, including uh, UN agencies, NGO representatives, uh, civilian governmental uh, entities, as well as um, uh, selected militaries uh, as well. And there additionally, uh, several um, uh, other people contributed to this process in their, in their, uh, in their personal capacity. Um, but just a few words about, about the process. We uh, convened in Geneva in uh, January, reached consensus on some framing questions that would frame the scope of this assessment. And the questions were along the lines of asking partners what their uh, needs and capacities are uh, for civil military coordination, what they see, how they see CMCS meeting those needs, what they see as uh, to be the main gaps and what they would like to see from CMCS moving forward. So partner organizations um, contributed written submissions that Brittany and I uh, analyzed. Uh, we also convened a series of uh, virtual group uh, discussions where uh, partners and CMCS engaged in discussion in reaction to some of our preliminary findings. Uh, and we also conducted um, 12 additional research interviews with people within CMCS and across other branches of, of OCHA. I also need to really thank two research assistants that uh, were uh, working with us on this uh, project, Natalie Montefor and, and Chris Koble. Um, they did great work and supported Brittany and I um, and every step of the process. Also want to extend a huge thank you to CMCS and all of the partners that engaged on this process. They spent a great deal of time um, preparing their written submissions and reading drafts that Brittany and I had uh, sent out um, uh, and providing feedback uh, as well. Uh, so we very much appreciated all the time and all the energy that uh, came in from all these uh, different organizations um, that fed into uh, our findings. Uh, and I will now kick it over to Brittany who will lay out a bit more uh, information about CMCS and, and the gaps that we found based on uh, partners' contributions. Great. Thanks, Rob. So as a starting point to establish a framework for our analysis, we examined the key activity areas of CMCS. And one can divide these areas into three categories. First, operational support, in which CMCS deploys personnel and provides technical advice. Uh, two, guidance and policy engagement in which CMCS develops and disseminates guidance and SIMCORD handbooks. And third, capacity building and strategic outreach in which CMCS facilitates training and workshops for humanitarian and military actors. Throughout our analysis, we identified 12 gaps related to these three main activity areas that we will now walk you through. So turning now to gaps identified in operational support, um, the first gap that partners flagged is that CMCS is delinked from the field. And one clear manifestation of this gap is that SIMCORD officers do not receive the support that they need from CMCS. Uh, additionally, partners noted that there is a lack of sufficient human resources for SIMCORD across OCHA. And this is a much broader structural issue that extends beyond CMCS, uh, but it does have direct uh, effects and implications. Uh, SIMCORD officer positions are often not filled by the right people with the right background, the training, and the expertise. And often it was flagged that there are gaps in positions being filled. Um, it was expressed that these gaps affect SIMCORD officers' ability to establish relationships and build trust, which is essential for SIMCORD. Another gap is that information sharing with external partners is insufficient. As a result, there's a lack of transparency between CMCS and its partners. And one example that was cited um, were multiple instances when partners were unable to get contact information for SIMCORD officers from CMCS. Finally, partners discussed a lack of clarity and guidance regarding SIMCORD officer engagement with non-state armed groups. This was a major discussion area 
for the partners, and there was widespread agreement that CMCS should not directly engage with non-state armed groups as it does with militaries. Um, it was noted that non-state armed group engagement should be led by actors in the field, and that CMCS should provide a supporting role. However, we thought it was important to note that partners did not agree how CMCS should prioritize this area of non-state armed group engagement support moving forward, as there are numerous gaps in their traditional activity areas that need to be addressed. Now turning to gaps in guidance and policy engagement, um, overwhelmingly it was flagged that existing SIMCORD guidelines are inconsistently operationalized. Um, it was noted that humanitarian actors often lack an awareness of the guidelines. They may not know where to even access the documents or even misunderstand their application. Um, tying into Nason's presentation as well, partners overwhelmingly said that there was a lack of training and guidance on humanitarian notification systems and said that this is a gap that CMCS must fill um, while drawing on past experiences and challenges. Finally, robust global policy, policy leadership regarding SIMCORD was seen to be lacking. Uh, but however, partners said that CMCS is well placed to draw connections between conversations happening in SIMCORD focused circles and the broader humanitarian sector. Uh, this includes uh, conversations on issues such as access, protection, and security. Finally, turning to gaps in capacity building and strategic outreach, partners want a robust community of practice but feel that one currently does not exist. Uh, it was said CMCS should lead the creation of this community and it would enable SIMCORD stakeholders to share information, lessons observed, and approaches to operational challenges with each other. Additionally, and this ties back into those broader structural issues that the report dives into, is that there is no standardized SIMCORD officer capacity building. There's a lack of standardized qualifications and training curriculum to certify SIMCORD officers before they go into the field for their positions. And it was felt that this means there's no assurance that those deployed are fit for the job. Relatedly, SIMCORD curriculum is seen as traditionally not being responsive to evolving operational needs and that CMCS should continuously update its curriculum in response to field-based challenges and experiences. We did want to note, however, that CMCS is in the process of currently updating its curriculum around access and protect protection, which is a welcome development. Partners also expressed that there's a need to expand outreach with militaries and in particular with non-Western governments and militaries. It was felt that CMCS has already significant buy-in from Western governments and so they really need to focus on who they may not be engaging with more frequently. However, overall, it was noted that military engagements need to be proactive and strategic because this will help CMCS understand the emerging trends in the SIMCORD landscape, and it will help CMCS develop forward-looking guidance to help the humanitarian sector. Finally, partners flagged a gap in the documentation and dissemination of operational experiences and best practices through after action reviews and other means, which we did recognize requires significant political buy-in, but we partners really expressed that there's a need for this moving forward. Thanks for that, Brittany. And now I'll just offer a few comments about what we heard from partners about what they would like to see as the route forward for CMCS. And I'll start by um, offering a bit of a vis visualization. Y'all know I love um, a good diagram. Um, so we have um, these three areas of CMCS's key activities. Um, but um, a, a crucial element that came out of the discussions is the importance of linking all of these three areas together. Um, so for one, linking capacity building and operational support. Uh, the link from capacity building to operational support is fairly clear. The aim is to ensure that people who are going into operational settings working uh, on SIMCORD um, have some background, have some training, have some baseline, baseline uh, knowledge 
of what the role uh, entails and what the sim board space is all about. But the feedback loop from the operational space to capacity building is also um, crucial to build to inform what uh, the scope of capacity building needs to be so that it's responsive to what's going on uh, in the field. Same goes for guidance and policy uh, engagement. Um, the purpose of guidance is, of course, so that people have an already uh, existing framework of principles that they can use when they enter, enter, enter into operational settings. Um, but uh, the feedback loop from operational environments to guidance is also incredibly important to inform what the gaps are in existing guidance, uh, when there's a need for uh, new guidance uh, to be uh, created. Uh, additionally, important to bridge a gap and establish a feedback loop between capacity building and guidance. Um, one aspect of capacity building is to um, sensitize um, relevant actors on what the guidance is, but capacity building moments can be a moment also for a CMCS to um, extract information through um, facilitating and observing peer-to-peer -peer discussions to get a sense of where those gaps are in that guidance. How do practitioners see guidance? Do they find it useful? Uh, in what ways uh, do they not find it useful? Um, so we just wanted to present this, uh, this sort of visual vision of how all of these different elements can and should link together. Uh, but all of this is to say that this vision highlights a couple things. One is the importance of the community of practice model that was very much uh, 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 emphasized by partners uh, throughout this process. The, that capacity building is not a one-way street. It's more about bringing people together, making connections. It's about peer-to-peer -peer, uh, support. Uh, two is the importance of information gathering, management, and analysis in order to really establish these feedback loops from the operational environment uh, to what CMCS does at a headquarters level in a meaningful way is going to require an investment in information uh, gathering and analysis so that uh, CMCS is well poised to uh, gather lessons uh, observed and learned uh, from the field. Um, so in our report, we sketch out a, a three-phase pathway uh, for CMCS uh, that reflects what we what we heard from partners throughout this process. Um, phase one, we call reinvigorating relationships and feedback loops. Uh, and we see phase one as entailing uh, reestablishing the link between CMCS and the field by engaging with SIMCORD officers, also engaging with military partners and engaging with humanitarian partners um, as well, uh, in addition to um, uh, increasing efforts on transparency by publishing information about where SIM court officers uh, are, are located, who is doing what where, and regularly publishing reports that give updates on um, CMCS's activities and key developments in the SIM court space, and also um, uh, systematizing the process of humanitarian notification uh, systems um, addressing all of the issues that Nissan discussed in the previous uh, presentation. Important to note also that CMCS has taken a lot of steps um, uh, in this direction over the course of this uh, reassessment uh, process, in particular by uh, convening SIM court officers, uh, convening partners in various uh, working groups, um, and also they are working on the humanitarian notification systems um, issue as well. Uh, phase two, is taking the next step and systematizing a community of practice, um, which will need to entail an investment in this information uh, gathering, whether that is in the form of after action reviews or ongoing monitoring uh, processes, uh, but important to establish a mechanism where there's an ongoing and systematized way for CMCS to um, extract information from what's go actually going on in the field and um, uh, being adaptive and responsive in its capacity building and its engagement in the development of guidelines um, accordingly. 
Um, in phase three, we call this phase expanding and deepening engagement in which CMCS can expand its uh, network of partners, uh, um, develop relationships with a wider array of military actors to do so in a forward looking way, looking not just at what the humanitarian crises are now, but what the humanitarian crises um, are likely to look la like in five years, in 10 years, and to proactively build relationships. Um, including with the Department of Peacekeeping Operations that was flagged by uh, partners as well um, as an area where there's a um, possibility for greater engagement um, and deepening engagement at, as well in that initially these this outreach and this cultivation of uh, relationships uh, can begin with uh, information sharing building rapport, but can then lead to deeper interactions, joint strategic planning, influence with military actors on planning and uh, doctrine. Additionally, we have a few recommendations that we direct more broadly to OCHA. Some of the issues that Brittany mentioned are not just specific to CMCS, but about OCHA more broadly and uh, how it engages and vests in SIMCORD. Uh, one is the process of SIMCORD personnel selection. We recommend that OCHA integrate CMCS, CMCS into the process of SIMCORD officer uh, personnel selection. They do, they, over the course of the um, assessment partners flagged as, as an issue, the fact that CMCS does not have a formalized role in this selection process. So this contributes to the divide between CMCS as a headquarters unit and what happens in the field. Uh, second recommendation is um, on the issue of non-state armed groups as OCHA uh, moves forward in developing its strategy for engaging with non-state armed groups. Um, as Brittany mentioned, the, the um, uh, sense from partners was that CMCS should not be uh, central to those efforts, but that in some way there must be a connection to those efforts and that it is important for OCHA to coordinate across its different uh, branches so that all relevant actors who um, might be supporting people on the ground who are engaging with non-state armed groups um, are connected and coordinating with one another. Uh, the final recommendation for OCHA is perhaps the mega recommendation, uh, which is uh, the importance of investing in SIMCORD. Um, what we lay out in this pathway forward is uh, a lot. And um, as I said, CMCS is already uh, making a lot of moves and a lot of positive forward motions to uh, already address a lot of the concerns that partners have um, raised throughout this process. But there's much more to do that will require um, a great deal of resources. It will require OCHA to reinvest in CMCS and will also require OCHA to uh, invest more broadly in SIMCORD, uh, even beyond CMCS, um, ensuring that there's an investment in uh, uh, SIMCORD officer personnel, making sure there's enough personnel in the field, uh, ensuring that SIMCORD as an issue has a prominent place on uh, the OCHA policy agenda. Um, I'll leave it at that. Those are, are some of our main findings. Uh, and I'll just uh, add as a final comment uh, over the course of this process and all of the discussions that we had and facilitated amongst partners, um, our findings obviously ref reflect various ways that partners uh, did not see CMCS to be living up to what partners uh, need and what they want, but I want to end on flagging the fact that partners do have a great enthusiasm for CMCS and the value that CMCS has. They have a great institutional memory. They have a lot of, um, of, of resources at their disposal that can be uh, leveraged. Um, so even though there are a wide, there's a wide array of gaps uh, highlighted. Um, CMCS has a, a network of partners um, that are depending on it and are very much rooting for, for CMCS uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this way. So I'll end it with that. I, we might have a couple, couple minutes for um, some questions uh, if there are any, but uh, it was a pleasure for us to, uh, 
uh, to share with you some of our findings from this process. Thank you so much, uh, both Rob and Brittany, for this incredible effort and for all of the partners that contributed to it. Um, we have one question from Zane Tayeb, who asks um, about a gap that she found during her work as a SIM court officer, uh, which is that SIM court officers are usually international staff in most cases, and that there is not enough investment in local capacities as well. This saves money, efforts, and can help greatly in humanitarian negotiations, especially in contexts where you have language barriers. So she's pointing this out as a gap and looking for your response. Yeah, thank you for the comment, uh, Zane. We absolutely heard that expressed um, by partners and interviewees um, uh, in, our, in our work as well. So I absolutely second that. Um, there are many out there who agree with that uh, concern and agree with um, the notion that when considering who should be targeted for uh, capacity building efforts, um, there needs to be more um, engagement with and integration with um, local um, humanitarian workers in those processes. I would also just add, yes, it was flagged throughout that, you know, looking forward as to what a roster of qualified SIM cord personnel looks like, um, really having an eye towards diversity and the types of profiles that are being used to recruit for these positions. And that's everything from nationality, race, ethnicity, and gender, because um, partners were very honest that they said these roles are often filled by uh, North American or European men with a military background. Um, we understand how that trajectory happens, but I think the question is, what can we do to address that to make sure that the right people are in the job and that it's reflective of what the context needs? Great, well, thank you to both. And if anyone has further questions, uh, please feel free to send them by email. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to read the report, um, we will be posting it soon. And um, we would really welcome any thoughts or feedback that you have on it. And now um, Dave and I will just have some concluding remarks. I will let uh, Dave go first. Hey, I just wanted to pass along my heartfelt thanks to everyone who joined us today. We, we appreciate four hours is a long time to be on Zoom uh, for your time. Uh, thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the R. Dudley Harrington Jr. Charitable Foundation that has now been publicly announced, and I can say thank you for that, and to the U.S. Naval War College Foundation. Um, we're excited to continue these engagements with you, and we really look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Adam? Yeah, and just as a final note, I wanted to really encourage everyone who joined us today to please join us tomorrow for our Civ Mill Humanitarian Response Workshop. As you heard this morning, most of the research questions that were presented today came out of our working groups at our last workshop. And tomorrow, uh, we'll hear from the working groups and have a chance to start to develop our future research agenda, as well as hear some really great talks from leaders in this field. So we hope that you'll all be able to join us uh, tomorrow morning as well. Same time, uh, same place. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>